Hello, I'm Jo Coburn. Welcome to Forsaken Futures, brought to you by Project Syndicate. How bad can things get? As if this summer's droughts, floods and millions displaced aren't omens enough. The world is on the brink of an energy crisis, a food crisis, and warnings from scientists that things are going to get worse. What caused them for optimism? Well, this afternoon, we hope to find out. Our sessions today. In a moment. Risky business. How should governments, businesses and investors navigate this ever more unpredictable new global economy? At 16.15 Central European time, justice underwater, can the big polluters ever be made to pay more for their damage to the global south? We speak to a young climate activist living in an area devastated by the floods. And at 17.15, could it finally be code green for geoengineering to save the planet? We'll be running over those questions and more with David Miliband, President and CEO of the International Rescue Committee. Laura Chinchilla is the former president of Costa Rica. Werner Hoyer is president of the European Investment Bank. Thomas Burble, CEO of AXA. Mohammed Nasheed, former president of the Maldives. And Bill McKibben, co-founder of 350.org. Now, if you have a hatred of being talked at, fear not. Social media is here to help. Let us know what you think using the hashtag Forsaken Futures. Now, to kick us off, who better to hear from than President of the European Investment Bank, Werner Hoyer. Europe is facing its worst gas supply crisis ever this winter linked to the war in Ukraine. Prices are soaring and major economies like Germany are considering rationing. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, we gather here today at a challenging time. Russia is holding the world hostage by using energy and food as weapons. Make no mistake, while Russia is fighting only in Ukraine, Russia's hostilities are directed at the entire global community. With our reliance on fossil fuels, we have made ourselves vulnerable to autocrats' whims. So when relations between our open societies and these powers fall into crises, energy costs explode. The oil-producing countries of the Arab world decided to use their oil as a political weapon. We saw it in 1973, 79, 1990, and we see it today again. At the same time, it is the burning of these fossil fuels that causes the planet to warm. And we can already witness the dramatic consequences. Pakistan faces the worst flood in its history. Europe, China, and the American West emerge from severe, prolonged droughts that cause crop failure and people to starve. Just as the violent conflicts with authoritarian states, climate change is already causing human suffering and costing lives. For our futures not to be forsaken, we have to come to grips with reality. While we are too late to fully avoid climate change, we have to stop it spiraling out of control and we have to adapt to its unavoidable consequences. Simultaneously, we would reduce our reliance on autocrats and dictators. Three things are crucial at this point. First, give investors, businesses and households the right incentives and the right regulatory frameworks to ensure they direct their funds towards low carbon projects. Investments in energy efficiency, renewable energies and green innovation must be an absolute priority. Second, we must start putting the decarbonization of the more challenging, hard to abate sectors such as heavy industry, shipping, aviation, into the focus. These are responsible for almost a third of global emissions and do not have an economic low-carbon alternative to fossil fuels as of today. Finally, we need to scale up adaptation finance and integrate adaptation considerations into all of our infrastructure projects globally. We must build railways, hospitals and other infrastructure in a way that can withstand more frequent and extreme weather events. The European Investment Bank is doing its part, mobilizing over $1 trillion in this decade towards a more sustainable economy and the transition to carbon neutrality. At the EIB, we have invested heavily in clean energy for many years, and we are supporting clean tech innovation. 
While some might be skeptical towards the public institution supporting innovation, it was the EIB, 20 years ago, financing offshore wind at a time when commercial banks would not be willing to engage. Today, we do the same thing with floating offshore wind, battery storage and green hydrogen. We will commit even more resources in these areas, deploying the full scale of our financial arsenal to back innovative projects that will help us deal with the challenge ahead. The EIB will triple its global adaptation finance by 2025. Already today, the EIB screens all the projects it finances for the risks of climate change and ensure they are adapted to future changes. But public support, no matter how generous, won't be enough to bankroll the transition to a net zero and climate resilient future. That's why involving the private sector is crucial for making the transition a success. And last but not least, we must make sure that workers and societies can prosper in the transition to a net zero carbon economy. We must support the communities that are most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. And if the transition will not be just and fair, we will fail. We will have no transition. At the end of the day, I am hopeful that Russia's attack on Ukraine with all the suffering it has caused, all the disruption it triggered on energy, food and raw material prices will be a breakthrough moment in the fight against climate change. Werner Hoyer setting the agenda there for today's discussions. Now to Risky Business, our first session today. Some, although not all economists, are warning that the global economy is teetering on the brink. Inflation, an energy crisis, rising interest rates, flaccid stock markets, where does it all leave the green transition? We have a new name, COVID-19. Russia launched a full-scale invasion on multiple fronts. The market is in deep. We just plummeted. It trapped. Firefighters continue the to... The heat wave that is hammering Europe. Now, I'm delighted to be able to introduce our wonderful panel for this session. Mary Burswarlick is Deputy Executive Director of the International Energy Agency. Megan Green is Senior Fellow at Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government and Global Chief Economist at Kroll. Thomas Brooks is CEO of the Global Strategic Communications Council. And Londre Senior is Professor and Executive Director at Thunderbird School of Global Management and a Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution. Welcome to all of you. Now, just one more reminder that we'd love it if you could flip open your phone and jump on the hashtag Forsaken Futures. We really do read every tweet, I promise. In around half an hour, we'll be opening up to take questions from journalists from around the world. But first of all, I'd like to start with Mary Burse Warlick. Um, Mary Fati Birol, executive director of the IEA, has warned we need to prepare for a long, hard winter. Just how bad is it? Well, thank you um, so much uh, for the opportunity to be with you today. Um, I think there's no question, as Dr. Birol has said, that um, we really are in the midst of the first um, global energy crisis and we're facing multiple challenges um, around the world as has already been mentioned an ongoing climate crisis um, continued threats from the pandemic a growing humanitarian crisis and more and um, these um, challenges are impacting clearly countries all around the world uh, but uh, this most severe effects uh, of the higher energy uh, and food prices and even climate-driven disasters are really falling on emerging and developing countries. And these crises really are um, significantly widening the gap between um, the rich and the poor, with many developing um, economies struggling financially and some facing real debt crises. 
Um, the IEA started warning about the risks uh, with regard to artificial um, tightness on the energy markets, especially in terms of gas supply, nearly a year ago, in fact. Um, but again, as was referenced, all of these threats uh, on the energy markets have really been exacerbated by uh, Russia's invasion into Ukraine and its subsequent steps to constrain and even cut off gas supplies. And um, we really are concerned, as you've just referenced, that the situation globally could get <clears throat> even tougher in the months ahead. In oil markets, without significant uh, improvements, um, high prices and volatile markets are likely to remain uh, mm. quite high. And, uh, and we're now projecting, however, that global oil supply will somewhat exceed demand growth in mid-2023. And on the natural gas side as well, with the effective cutoff from of natural gas uh, deliveries from Russia to Europe, we're seeing not only sky-high natural gas prices, but also on the electricity market, something that has really captured um, concern and interest on the part of European officials. In particular, we saw today the remarks from uh, the European Commission President yeah. von der Leyen about this very issue and the EU Energy Council staking some of the up some of these issues again later this month. Okay, well thank you very much for setting that out and all of the challenges and it is extremely serious. But Thomas, perhaps you could give us a bit of context here. If you had to pick one historical comparison for where we find ourselves today, what would it be? Uh, thanks very much and thanks very much for the very tough question. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I, I, I'm not actually sure there really is a historical, a useful historical comparison. Obviously, right. there's there's been a lot of crises in history. There's been energy crises of various different kinds. Ki kinds. I think uh, it was Fadi Birol in said who said that we are experiencing the first ever truly global energy energy crisis. Um, and I think he's obviously right. It comes at the same time as I think your introduction pointed out a global food crisis, which is striking very, many different countries in very many different ways obviously a public health crisis, all of these have climate elements. And to, I think, in a way, the most significant change in the way, in the situation that we've now got is that we've got all of these various dynamics that are obviously interconnected happening within society, but they're happening in the pressure cooker of climate change. And the impacts mm -hmm. and effects of the climate crisis, it's like a force multiplier for so many of these issues and the way that those interconnected issues negatively impact each other. And what we also know is that it creates circumstances in communities, mm. in countries, in regions that drive towards conflict, that drive towards a whole set of other social and socioeconomic and socio-political issues that essentially exacerbate those crises. So I think the really big difference that we've got here is that most of our natural instincts if you will, or the established mm. ways of doing things, the ways in which we would normally, if you will, respond to a crisis are actually in this case likely to make it worse. Okay. And that is one of the things where I think we've really got to come to the conclusion that we are not going to solve the problems of the 2020s, essentially with the tool set of the 1980s and 1990s. Well, look, let's have a look at a, a stark contrast between uh, the United States and Europe. Megan, I'm just going to show everybody this graph using World Bank data because it is very, very clear the difference. In red, you can see the natural gas price in the USA bumping fairly low down, and in blue, that spike it's Europe. Is the story here, the takeaway, that America is in a much better position economically as a result of its investment in and access to fossil fuels? Yeah, I think in the short term, that's right. Uh, as a result of the shale revolution, the U.S. managed to achieve energy independence. Um, now, oil prices have actually gone up uh, more significantly in the U.S. than gas prices because oil is, is a global market. But because of the infrastructure necessary to deliver gas, it's not a global market. And what we're seeing now is that Actually, Europe is importing more gas from the U.S. at the moment than it is from Russia. That was already the case uh, even before Nord Stream 1 was shut down fully. Um, and so the U.S. does have energy independence and is, is not only not reliant on Russia for gas, mm. but it's actually exporting gas. Um, I should highlight that, you know, the gas isn't coming on the same form. So the U.S. is exporting uh, LNG. Uh, and, you know, there's storage constraints in Europe for LNG and also you can't just, you know, snap your fingers and transform LNG back into the kind of natural gas 
that you ship through pipelines. So, um, you know, the U.S. is able to export it to Europe. That's a benefit for the U.S. economy, certainly. Um, but Europe can't just swap it into um, in for pipeable natural gas. There are issues there. Um, I will say, however, that before Russia invaded Ukraine, the U.S. was already facing an energy crisis, which isn't something that most mm. people think about. It's consensus that Europe was facing an energy crisis. Mm. Uh, but for the U.S., there's been chronic underinvestment uh, in fossil fuels starting in 2014 in the so-called you know Thanksgiving Day massacre when oil prices really plummeted. Um, and, and also during COVID, we saw oil prices go negative. Um, and so I do think that even though demand has rebounded in the U.S., supply hasn't managed to keep up pace, in part because uh, energy companies are incentivized to pass out dividends rather than invest in, in new production. And, and it's also partly the result of the ESG movement. It was actually one of the intended consequences, but it does mean that the U.S. is in a much better position yes. than Europe, but it's not in a great position overall in terms of energy, because, of course, we aren't developing renewables at, at the rate we need to in order to hit our Paris climate goals. OK, well, an interesting picture there, um, or a mixed picture, as you have put it, Megan, then, in the U.S. Um, Londre Senior, you're an American-based expert in African economics. How differently is this crisis playing out around the world, particularly in the global south? Absolutely. Uh, Africa has always faced uh, challenges related to energy, related to food security. For example, more than uh, 620 million people on the continent still uh, do not have access to electricity. And we also know the drastic impact uh, of uh, the uh, Ukraine-Russia crisis mm. uh, on the development on, in terms of food security. For example, uh, Kenya was importing about 30% of wheat from uh, Russia, uh, Cameroon uh, was also importing about 44% uh, of its fertilizer from Russia, and Ghana was importing about 60% of iron ores uh, and steel from Ukraine. So to put things in context, it's important to note that uh, more than 140 million people even before the pandemic uh, were displaced, economically mm. disadvantaged people were displaced based uh, on climate uh, effect. And this in Sub-Saharan Africa, in South Asia, and in Latin uh, America. So weather uh, related displacement only a year before the pandemic was about 25 million uh, people. So the crisis that we uh, many are observing now and which are of course exacerbated by COVID-19 and by the uh, Ukraine-Russia crisis uh, uh, were already felt by mm. many of the uh, sub-Saharan African countries even before the, uh, those crises. Right. Well, Andre, thank you uh, for that. Mary, I just want to um, pick up with you on some of the reaction um, around the world uh, when it comes to solutions uh, to shortages of energy, potential shortage of, shortages of energy. Let's just look at this headline from Bloomberg, uh, because this summer Kosovo started turning off the power every six hours due to the energy crisis. Now, it's a solution of sorts, I suppose you could say. It's also a big problem. How widespread do you think this sort of thing could be? Well, I think it's important um, to, to to recognize that a story such as the as the one you just pointed to really underscore the seriousness of the crisis and um, the urgent and um, immediate steps that countries around the world are needing to um, take to, to deal with it. So it's no surprise that there's a whole range of solutions that are being looked at, even solutions that countries um, perhaps even a year ago thought were unthinkable, right? Whether it's returning to the use of uh, coal plants and restarting nuclear facilities, um, uh, pumping out more oil and gas um, to deal with uh, the um, immediate um, challenges. Um, but our view really is that we should look at this um, uh, while addressing um, the near term immediate and, and serious challenges, really look at this time as a moment of opportunity 
to double down on investments in um, the clean energy transition and renewables and putting the world on a path that will um, better um, uh, situate it um, in, in energy security terms for dealing with future such challenges. Right. Um, and, um, and so that's, I think, a really important point to, to underscore. Um, there's a significant amount of increase that needs yeah. to go into investments and in developing the clean energy technologies that will accelerate this process as well. Well, Londra, you were nodding um, away there just towards the end of uh, Mary's comments. Um, I mean, there are other uh, potential solutions, aren't they? This energy crisis and climate change both need to be mitigated by lower energy consumption and the people watching should consume less. Right or wrong, Londre? Absolutely. I think that uh, it is important when thinking about the long term, you have the consumption, reducing the consumption. But also, energy transition is really critical. And uh, we have now many forces which are pushing toward investing in uh, fossil fuels uh, because of the conflict uh, that we have uh, right now. So, but let me highlight a point, a report by uh, the Thunderbird School of Global Management highlighted the phenomenal potential that we have in investing in new technology only for a carbon removal, the, uh, uh, the estimated economic uh, potential uh, is about one to three trillion US dollar of direct uh, economic uh, em impact, but broadening it. Uh, to uh, social, economic, and environmental impact, those could reach three to five trillion US dollar. So I think that investing in innovation in the fourth industrial revolution will really be critical uh, in order to successfully meet global demands, and especially in the context of development economies where uh, the, the, the notion of climate justice uh, mm. is being as well. Right, Megan, are there any good solutions um, to all this that don't involve massive government intervention? And do you think with that intervention is a sort of quid pro quo where governments can say to people, consume less? Yeah, so unfortunately, there's no real silver bullet here um, that will massively help um, in the short run, I think, because you have to worry about uh, the unintended consequences of some of these government interventions. For example, an energy price cap um, is incredibly regressive um, that, you know, the UK has announced mm. by way of example. It's incredibly regressive. It benefits rich people with big houses to heat um, much more than low income households who they're trying to support. It does doesn't encourage a reduction in demand of consumption at all. Um, and yet it does address the cost of living crisis. Economists have been revising downwards their inflation forecasts, which is all positive. So there's no one policy that's going to go ahead uh, and, and tick all boxes. Um, and so unfortunately, I think that most of these government intervention um, attempts are addressing the supply side of things, uh, that the cost of living crisis, but aren't reducing demand over the medium to long term. Um, unfortunately, you know, as governments have sold the green transition, um, I think you know politicians and economists haven't been particularly honest about the medium to long term costs of that, and fundamentally. We're going to have to start pricing in something we previously considered free, which is the price of carbon. Um, that's going to be inflationary, and so there will be distributional consequences, and that will eat into standard, standards of living. There's almost no way around that. Um, it's fundamentally worth it, I think, but that argument hasn't really been put out there. And of course, now in Europe in particular, they're trying to undergo a green transition in a major hurry, um, and so those costs the faster you make the transition, the bigger those costs are going to be. There's just no way around it. But, um, you know, you can try to compensate the losers. That's something that governments can go ahead and do with some redistribution. Um, but I think it starts with highlighting, you know, these are the costs. Things are going to be more expensive, not just energy, but anything that requires energy. So right. virtually all goods. Um, and then try to compensate the losers. That's the best that we can do. And at yeah. the same time, try to incentivize the green transition and bring in some private sector capital um, by setting up both carrots and sticks. So regulations and also subsidies to find alternatives and, and incentivize uh, investment in them.
Uh, Thomas, do you agree broadly with that analysis that, that things, life is just going to get m more expensive? Government should be honest um, about that uh, going forward. I mean, one other response has come from uh, the French President Emmanuel Macron. Um, they've announced the nationalisation of EDF um, in response to the energy crisis. A good or a bad thing? Well, I think one of the key things you have to take into account is the cost of inaction, um, which is obviously, I mean, you know, the, a single climate event this year is wiped the best part of 5% of Pakistani GDP. Mm. These are huge costs. And this is, this is not going to recover quickly. It's not as if this doesn't happen again next year or doesn't be, isn't worse in 2025 or worse in 2027. It absolutely is. And we know the trajectory, right? The IPCC and indeed the IEA have made it very clear no new oil and gas production anywhere in the world is compatible with a 1.5 global warming goal. And we know what happens to the ecosystems. We know what happens to sea level rise. We know what happens to the weather. This is all very, very accurately described in all of these scientific reports. And I think that talking about the costs has to take into account a definition of the cost of inaction. And I think actually the thing that governments haven't been clear about really is not the costs of action, it's the costs of inaction. And I think actually economists have kind of played into that to a significant degree as well, because right. they tend to view government policy as a cost. Whereas essentially, you know, you try and cost benefit analysis this to some extent. Well, you know, the cost is we managed to build an, an, an energy system and indeed, you know, at the basis of our economy, as you said, it is the basis of our economy in so many ways that is sustainable and resilient. That's, you know, that's, we've got going to have to pay for that. The benefit is we don't all fry. So, you know, how do you then start to kind of build that into mm. an economic model? And it, as I said, I just don't think that the, the ways that we are currently conceiving of how these costs are going to be distributed, what is clear is, yes, there is going to have to be a huge amount of redistribution goes on right. in order to fairly take on some of the crises that we're facing. And that, I think, was the point that Landry made so incredibly accurately earlier. Yes. And I think that, you know, that rich and poor play, it doesn't just happen between countries, right? It's happening within countries. We're going to have to address that. But well, government policy is going to have to be a really, really key piece of addressing this okay, because well, we do not have time. Megan and Londre both want to come back um, on this. Megan, I'll start with you and then I'll come to you, Londre. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight that I, I agree with all of that. Um, I wasn't trying to argue that there are costs and consequently we shouldn't undergo this transition. Um, it just reminds me a little bit of the globalization debate um, amongst economists where, you know, we said globalization was unambiguously good and would be good for everyone. And we were making the same argument about the green transition. And I think overall, um, on balance, it's absolutely worth doing. Uh, but no one's highlighting that there will be costs. And in the globalization debate, that's caused a backlash that we're, we're seeing now. Um, and I just don't think we have time for that backlash with the green transition. So I think it's worth being upfront about the costs and doing it anyhow. Landre? I just wanted to say that if consuming less is an option in the uh, global north, uh, in the global south, and especially uh, in uh, some of the countries in uh, Africa and in Latin America, uh, there's a, already a, an energy crisis, a shortage. As I mentioned earlier, more than 620 uh, uh, million people in Africa do not have access to electricity, let, the, let alone the need uh, to uh, provide that energy for to advance industrial development, manufacturing, amount order. So in the global conversation, it's important, of course, uh, to uh, consider both the imperative of adjusting the dynamics um, yes. in countries such as the US or in many of the European countries, but to also take into consideration the just transition and the importance yes. for the less advanced economy. Mary, do you have um, anything you'd like to say in response to what you've heard? Yeah, I think it's important to also focus on the opportunities. And I understand the importance of really realistically assessing the risks and the costs. Um, we just, for example, recently released the first ever um, world um, employment, um, uh, energy employment report. And in it, we found um, uh, good growth taking place across the energy um, sector um, with 65 million people uh, now employed. This is as of 2019 um, and a, a good rebound in the post-COVID era um, with um, over 50 percent of those jobs or about 50 percent of those jobs being in the clean, in clean energy employment, which is uh, 
uh, resulting um, uh, is due to um, growth in energy infrastructure and, uh, and further investments in this sector. So um, we see um, a real growing opportunity there. Um, and um, I think, uh, maybe, and maybe we'll get to this a little bit later, but it, it, it seems to me that uh, governments in, in a number of major economies are taking really proactive, important proactive steps um, to in incentivize investments um, in the clean um, energy sector uh, from the EU to the US to Japan and their green transformation plan. Um, yes. China is continuing a pace with its uh, its good successes in renewables and EV investments, and, and India taking steps as well. well so I, I think it's important to, to fo also focus on some of those solutions. No, absolutely. As you say, um, something positive um, in some respects. And on that, actually, uh, Mary, what is a realistic timeline in your mind for a green energy transition? Well, we've really focused a lot of attention on... Um, uh, achieving net zero emissions by 2050. And this is a goal that many countries around the world now have um, aligned themselves with, some a little bit later in terms of the, of the timeline. Um, but I think that this is, a, is really an important North Star for, for countries to keep in mind as they're um, making decisions. And we are uh, working very hard here at the IEA to track progress with respect to the commitments that have been made and our goals uh, in, uh, in, in achieving the goals in that mm. direction. I'll Are be honest track? that there's uh, a lot more work to do. There's <laughs> yes. no question. And I think if we set additional benchmarks, looking at where we can be by 2030 and 35, there is still time for real commitments um, to be made. So um, that, is, um, that is something that we are working with um, quite a number of uh, governments around the world on um, just a, a week or so ago, um, we launched a net zero uh, um, a report with Indonesia um, that is mm -hmm. at, uh, in, in connection with their G20. And um, so that's, um, that's for us, I think, um, important to, to keep a close eye on. Oh, well, let's stick with uh, this theme in terms of sort of timelines and how likely uh, we are uh, to achieve net zero by 2050. Um, Thomas, I'd just like you to comment on, on this chart that I'm going to show everybody. It's a Eurobarometer poll from March last year. Now, for anyone who doesn't know, it's widely considered the gold standard of understanding public opinion in the EU. Now, as you can see here to the first question, how serious a problem do you think climate change is? Yep, 93 percent certainly say fairly serious or very serious. Are you personally responsible for tackling climate change? 41 percent, obviously significantly lower. What does that tell us about people's appetite to finding green solutions for the energy crisis, which hit them personally? I think, to be honest, what it shows is a realistic view amongst most people of what yes. their capacity <laughs> to deal with the crisis is, mm. right? Because the vast number of people, what options have they got? Can they you know, vast, suddenly spend vast amounts more money on ensuring that they have access to particular types of food? For example, do they have a choice of where they get their energy from? Can they make the necessary investments in their house to be able to make it passive or you know, take it off the grid and run it entirely off renewables? Most people don't have that kind of money. Can they buy an electric car? It's still quite expensive. Most people know that a lot of the decisions that are going to change the economy in fundamental ways and make it more resilient don't actually rest with individuals, right? They rest with large corporations, they mm. rest with supply chains, they rest with government policy to a really significant degree. And of course, they rest with the extent to which there is momentum behind change, right? And there's, you know, there are a lot of answers to the question, why hasn't climate action happened at the speed that it should have and the accel you know, with the acceleration that, that we've seen, for example, in um, the EV space, right, we're really starting to see that take off now. The kind of green swan element of that is starting to is starting to show. But in many other areas, you know, why haven't we built the, the, um, the point was made earlier about the lack of investment in renewable energy for infrastructure in the US, for example, even in Europe, where there's been a fair amount that could have been a heck of a lot more. And we certainly haven't dealt with issues like the grid to the extent that we could have. You have to align government policy, but also political interests. There has been a lot of opposition and it hasn't come from people, as you say, as those those uh, numbers show. Individuals out there, if you like, normal people, right, understand that this is a huge problem, 
mm. understand and want real action on it, but they are also understand the extent. There is some stuff they can do. They can change their diet. They can ride a bicycle instead of taking a car, etc. But if they live out in the countryside, they don't have access to public transport, etc. They're reliant on a lot of fossil fuel driven infrastructure, which has to be changed at a systemic level, not just at an individual level. Do you agree with that, Londre? Absolutely. I agree uh, with what was said previously what, uh, by Thomas, of course, and uh, Mary as well. So it is extremely uh, important to think about this holistically. And we have a unique opportunity now uh, because uh, in public policies in general, the alignment of the problem, the policy of the politics offer a unique window of opportunity for action. And uh, both in the global south, in Europe, in, the, in North America, and, and uh, so we have a convergence about what solution is needed for the world so the politics is aligned, the policies are there, and uh, multi-stakeholder collaboration. I, when, when I attended Davos, most of uh, the global corporation really uh, have really committed to also reduce, to make progress uh, toward those. So through multi-stakeholder collaboration, I think it's a possibility. Right. Mary, why um, is battery storage so important for a green transition? Um, well, it's uh, it, uh, b batteries and uh, battery storage are becoming increasingly por important for um, various components of this uh, clean energy um, uh, and green transition, whether you look at uh, electric vehicles, um, whether you look at, uh, at, at, at other components. And um, as, um, as was just briefly referenced, um, for that reason, um, it's uh, it's it's really important that we think about supply chains and in that regard, um, supply chains related to um, critical minerals. Um, there is a significant concentration of some of these critical minerals in just a handful of countries. Um, uh, cobalt um, being um, heavily um, located in the um, in the in the DRC. Democratic Republic of the Congo and um, several other uh, critical minerals um, heavily concentrated in just a handful of countries. Um, as the um, continued progress is made in investing in the clean energy transition, there will be a, a growing uh, reliance on electrification of the system as well. And so um, it's, uh, it's going to be um, incredibly important that um, the kinds of components that are essential for running um, so much of our um, of our uh, energy system in a new way are available, and that we don't find ourselves in the kind of situation that many countries have been today, where there's a significant over reliance on one or two suppliers. Um, so these supply chain issues and those related to critical minerals are something that we are looking very closely at the IEA. Um, it's of great interest to our member countries. Right. And we're just beginning to look at ways in which um, we can ensure that um, not only we, the members of the IEA, but that the global economy is better um, situated in energy security terms, even as we invest um, even more uh, into um, the new components of this clean um, energy world. Right. Well, on that, uh, Megan, I'm just going to show everybody this graph showing the increase in investment in battery storage in recent years. In your mind, what's the right balance between the state and the private sector in finding solutions like this? Um, so I don't know exactly what the right balance is, but I can highlight that we're nowhere near it, um, <laughs> just in terms of needing the private sector um, to finance a lot more of this. Um, it's up to the public sector to set the incentives. Um, and then the idea is that the private sector can provide um, some of the financing off of the back of that. And I would say that um, if the private sector had sufficient incentives uh, to finance the green transition, we would be there by now, but they clearly don't. Um, and so there is a role for government policy. Um, we're not doing nearly enough mobilization of private sector funding. Interestingly, in conversations about the green transition that I have with policymakers, the ESG movement virtually never comes up unless I bring it up. So there is a big gap yeah. between um, the ESG movement, which is sort of how the private sector is really engaging with all of this, 
um, and and how policymakers are thinking about this. And that gap needs to be bridged. Um, there are a few things that we could see done differently, I think, to um, really incentivize funding, uh, private sector funding, uh, to go into the green transition. One is that you know central banks uh, can go ahead and identify alternatives to fossil fuels and, and subsidize the heck out of them, um, to use a technical term. Uh, and they can do that by setting up um, incentives with interest rates. So you can use a really low interest rate or a negative interest rate even um, for banks to borrow from a central bank if they pass that money on as loans for the green transition. And that would mobilize a lot of private capital into the green transition. It's a very unpopular time to be highlighting that central banks could do more um, because most central banks are trying to do less in order to lean against inflation. But I do think this model where we identify alternatives and sub subsidize them a lot um, could be useful also because it could be good for growth. So I mentioned there are costs certainly to the green transition. If you use all carrots, so all carbon taxes or carbon prices, uh, and regulation, then mm. that's bad for growth overall. Um, if you use uh, carrots and, and use subsidies, then that's actually good for growth. Um, I think the mix is, is a, a combination of the two. That's the right way to go about it. Europe is closer to that than the U.S. actually. We, we tend to just go with subsidies so far here in the U.S. Um, I think you need both carrots and sticks. Um, okay. But clearly the incentives haven't been set up by policymakers to mobilize private capital. Thank you for that. We're going to open the floor soon in a few minutes time uh, to journalists who will pose their questions to our panelists. But I'm going to get all strict and disciplined here. No more than five word answers or thereabouts anyway. Um, two years ago, Project Syndicate's big annual conference was called the Green Recovery. Very quickly now we're largely out of the COVID crisis. Was it a green recovery? Thomas, you first. No. Is the, is the very okay, you can do short. it in less than five words, <laughs> or fewer, I should say, than five words. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it didn't pan out that way. I think there were, there were a great number of opportunities that could have been taken that weren't. Um, and, yeah, we didn't have, I think, to Megan's point about, yeah, the incentives weren't in, weren't in place, but also, to be honest, I think the regulation wasn't in place either, and not enough work was done in that, in that time to really shape the outcome um, in a in a in a significant way. But yeah, we, we did not take the opportunity as it presented itself at that point. Was it a green recovery, Mary? I think it was the start of, uh, of, mm -hmm. of, a, um, of, an, of a recovery that will take um, significant, require continued significant commitment and intention going forward. Um, there are a huge number of challenges. There's no questions. We, we've touched on many of them. There's the innovation challenge and making sure we continue to invest in the technologies that are going to be needed to support the uh, clean energy economy. There's a huge investment gap. I know that the, the, the challenges with regard to energy access have already been highlighted, um, but there's much more that needs to be done to address that investment gap in the emerging and developing world um, in particular. Um, but I do think that we can turn this uh, into a really um, historic opportunity to double mm -hmm. down and really making, putting in place both the, the policy uh, okay. framework as well as investing significantly and seriously in really turning, um, and turning this, uh, moving this forward. Okay, Londre? I think that the global policy and business leader can still seize this unique momentum uh, to foster a green uh, global economy. And uh, some of the solutions which could be used, for example, by the public sector may include the reduction of the trade barriers for green products and services, the increase uh, of restriction for environmentally harmful uh, goods and services uh, amount order. But we really have a unique momentum, especially with the fourth industrial revolution, emerging technologies and uh, a global understanding that we cannot continue to act as we did in the past. OK, quite good. My five words might have got uh, lost here at the limit. But Megan, to you. Mm -hmm. Not at all, I would say. But um, if there is cause for optimism, I can say in that as an economist, and I think it really is because of COVID, I can't go anywhere without talking about the green transition. Climate change really is on the agenda across the board. And I think that's at least a positive step. 
Thank you. It's time to open up the floor with questions from journalists around the world. First of all, Anne Ran, Editor-in-Chief, China Newsweek. Your question. Hello. Uh, thank you for taking my question. My name is Ran Yan, and I'm from China Newsweek. Uh, yeah, my question is, in the post-pandemic era and following the COVID lockdown, uh, this case is in China now, how can public policy, finance and business to keep balance between preventing the economic growth from slowing down and protecting the communities in climate-related risks. Thank you. Uh, Landre, you go first. Uh, I think it's extremely important, and thank you very much for the question. I think it's extremely important uh, to understand. Uh, a point noted by uh, Megan, and I think instead of very earlier, she stated that uh, in terms of green economy, the Democratic Republic of Congo was playing an important role. Uh, so as a matter of fact, DRC is a home to 70% of world reserve in Colbert, 60% in Coltan, and the fourth produ uh, producer uh, of Cooper, as, but yet more than 73% of the population live below uh, poverty line. So in thinking about uh, transition, uh, I, I think that measures have to be adopted uh, to ensure that during the transition, the countries could still, especially in emerging uh, economies, but also in advanced economy, because you have seen these type of challenges also in the United States, that the, that the transition is smooth uh, versus uh, overnight, versus radical and overnight. So I think the timing, the momentum will make yeah. a difference so that People are not left behind, whether in advanced economies or uh, between the advanced economies and the developing nations. Megan? Yeah, so I think it is an important point to highlight that a lot of the minerals that are needed for batteries and battery storage are, are rare and are mined from emerging markets. And so as uh, we see emerging markets move up the value chain, um, install things like air conditioning more widely, um, th there's going to be more competition for those minerals. Um, and I think that's a challenge um, in terms of developed countries um, looking to not face greater competition for these, these minerals that are already in, in relatively short supply, um, but still wanting these emerging markets to move up the value chain and, and expand economically. That's, that's going to be a real trick. And I think um, developed markets have pledged a whole bunch of funding for emerging markets. They haven't actually come through on the vast majority of it. And so the balance there is way off as well. So we have to say goodbye um, just slightly earlier to both Megan and Londre. Thank you both very much uh, for joining us and answering um, those questions um, to take us into this final part of the session. Um, thank you. Let's go to our next questioner, uh, journalist Clara Wasserhus from Information in Denmark. Clara, your question. Yes, um, yeah, I'm a journalist at the Independent Daily Information. And my question is, the COVID-19 crisis in 2020 triggered the largest annual drop in global energy-related carbon dioxide emissions since the Second World War. In general, COVID, uh, CO2 emissions can only be seen to be dropping when a major international crisis brings growth to a standstill. What conclusion does the panel draw? Mary, do you want to go first? Sorry, I didn't catch the uh, the question at the end there. Oh, let me just uh, let me just uh, repeat it for you. Um, Clara was asking um, about the drop in CO2 emissions. They dropped hugely during the pandemic, and even despite this global energy crisis, levels continue to drop. But what conclusions can we draw from that? Well, I think it's not surprising that um, the CO2 levels dropped during the pandemic at a period of time when the economic global economic activity uh, really really fell off. And it's also then not surprising that as that um, that is part of the recovery, both uh, with respect to the pandemic and the uh, global economic recovery, we saw energy demands beginning to pick up again. And now we're seeing even even more of that now, right, as uh, as travelers are, are flying more and driving more and so on. Um, so I, I do think it's um, not, like I said, not 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 surprising, but it's um, something that we uh, need to be very mindful of. And I think particularly at this time, period of uh, real 
uh, energy um, energy supply crises, as some of the heavily um, CO2 emitting fossil fuels are are back in in higher use again. So I just come back to the point that I've mentioned a number of times that we need to really look at this as a as a period of time uh, as a historic um, turning point or an opportunity to take a real historic turning point in doubling down our investments um, in, the, in the clean energy future. Thank you for that. Clara Vasahus, thank you for your question. Um, let's go to Ryan McDonald, Senior Editor, Globe and Mail in Canada. Your question. Oh, thank you very much. I'm sorry Megan's not here. I was going to congratulate uh, an American economist on uh, bringing up the idea of putting a price on carbon. But um, <laughs> I guess my, <laughs> my question um, probably relates most to what uh, Tom was discussing in terms of this uh, pressure cooker that we are now facing. In the short term, um, we have an energy crisis that is hiking inflation and is, is putting pressure on, on GDP. Um, and I think this has a, a very real potential to spill over into the global economy and create a recession. So um, I guess my question is, is what does the prospect of a deep recession uh, mean for these long term investments in renewable energy? because these are the things that are going to be necessary to build resilience. Thomas? Yeah, look, it's a really good question. And I think slightly relates to Clara's previous question as well about like it, it seems to have taken like these huge global economic shocks in order, mm -hmm. to, in order to make any kind of shot at emissions reduction. And I think one of the key things here is that we're going to have to think about how we finance this transition in a different way than how we, we've thought about how economies develop in the past. Um, I think I made the earlier point, you know, we will not solve the, the problems of this coming decade, which is the decisive decade in terms of in terms of the fight against climate change and the fight against the crisis is concerned. We will not make the changes we're going we're to make if we if we're relying on the tools essentially of the 1980s, which is broadly where neoliberal economics is stuck, if, if you know, give or give or take. There are further discussions, clearly. But look, if we if we are pushed into a recession by um, by this crisis, which obviously is 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 certainly um, possible, you are going to have to find ways of building um, investments into the infrastructure of the energy system so that we don't get the outcome that we got at the end of COVID, which was that emissions went back up. Right. And because we can't afford that again. What we need, and the IPCC has shown this, and the and the IEA, brilliant work that Mary and her team have done in term of in terms of mapping the development of the energy system to mm. um, to those emission scenarios. We can't have any new oil and gas production anywhere in the world. We need massive electrification on a truly colossal scale. It is a challenge, and it's going yeah. to be an even greater challenge in the in the in the um, context of a of a recession. But that is what needs to happen. And therefore, we're going to have to think about interventions in these markets. You know, what we've seen this this week in terms of it now looks like Europe will decouple the gas price from the electricity price. There will be a windfall tax on on um, major fossil fuel producers. Yeah. These things were unthinkable three months ago. Right. And what I think people are starting to understand is we are in a context here. We're in a set of circumstances where some very, very different kinds of thinking about how we make change is going to have to be adopted. Um, in order to be able to make the changes we need to make. Tom, thank you, and thanks for your question, Ryan. Our final question comes from Dr. Olukayoda Oyelaya, Consulting Editor at Business AM in Nigeria. Your question. Thank you very much, and good afternoon. My question has to do with Next year, Africa in particular, that's and I want to make reference very, very different to, kinds of thinking. I want to make reference to how countries we make that depend on commodities for their economic survival, like the DRC that has been mentioned, like Niger Republic that depends on uranium export, and of course a country like uh, Zambia, all of which their products are being used as raw materials for power. Uh, you're just breaking up there. I think we've just lost you. Mary, did you get the, the just... Green, uh, 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 economy uh, and green. That is the em environmental... Okay, I'm going to cut in. Um, I'm sorry, because the line is just a little bit unstable. Mary, did you get the gist of that question? Uh, could you briefly answer? Yes, I answer? think so. Um, yeah, okay. I, I, just make, I just make two important points, I think, or, or two basic points. One is it's important that um, those countries who are um, rich in um, the kinds of critical minerals that, uh, and rare earth minerals uh, that will be important for um, the new um, clean energy um, economy 
that that investment take, continues to take place in a way that, as has been referenced, will really benefit the people um, in those countries, will create new jobs, and do so in a, um, in a people-centered and in a just way. There's no question there. But I think it's also really important to underscore the point we've also been touching on a little bit, which is the importance of looking for ways to unlock the financing for the necessary investment in those countries um, so that they're able to diversify their economies and really make the investments needed also um, in renewables, in other sorts of clean energy um, sources. And, and, and this has to come not only from governments, not only from multilateral development banks, but from the private sector. And I think unlocking that private sector capital and reducing the cost of capital um, uh, and financing in those countries is, is really important. Um, the right. IEA, along with a few other partners, is going to be releasing a new report on this topic next week called the Cost of Capital Observatory uh, in Pittsburgh. So I recommend uh, colleagues um, and, and friends um, take a look at, at that as well. Um, right. But we this is an area that really needs a lot of attention. Well, you heard it here first. I'm afraid we're out of time for this conversation. Thank you so much to all of our esteemed panelists, Mary, Megan, Londre and Thomas, for taking part. Let's get the thoughts now of Dan Jorgensen, Denmark's Minister of Climate, Energy and Public Utilities, to wrap up this session. The theme for Second Futures could not have been more timely. This summer, heat waves hit Europe hard. In England, the temperature reached more than 40 degrees Celsius. In Germany, the Rhine River dried up, and in Italy, they experienced the worst droughts in 70 years. It is no longer a question of if or when climate change will affect us. Climate change is already here. The question is how bad things will get. So while this summer was remarkable, it may unfortunately also be the new normal. Climate change is not the only thing that has developed faster than anticipated. So has, fortunately, renewable energy. The global average price of offshore wind power has declined by 60% since 2010. Today, it can provide cheaper energy than most fossil fuels. It is a paradoxical development. On the one hand, climate change is hitting us sooner than we thought. On the other hand, the green transformation has gone faster than we expected. So while we live in dark times, there is no doubt that the future can be green. It is a cause for optimism, something we need in a time of uncertainty. Six months ago, Russia invaded Ukraine without provocation, without justification, at a time where we thought of war in Europe as a relic. Now, Russia is trying to push Europe into an energy crisis, using their energy as a political weapon. Europe fearing an energy crisis got some bad news today. Russia announcing it will keep the Nord Stream pipeline shut down. But while we're in the middle of an energy crisis, it is also an opportunity for us to create a new energy future and to become independent of Russian fuels. It will not be easy. Changing our energy system is like turning around a super tanker. It takes time and must be done carefully. But I think there is a cause for optimism. The price of renewable energy is cheaper than fossil fuels. Our energy systems are becoming greener. And here in Denmark, more than 50% of our electricity is generated by wind and solar power. And that's just the beginning. My government has decided to dramatically increase Denmark's renewable energy capacity. We will increase our offshore wind power fivefold over the next eight years. This development is not unique to Denmark and the other Nordic countries. A few weeks ago, Denmark hosted the Baltic Sea Energy Security Summit. At the summit, the eight countries set out to increase the offshore wind capacity sevenfold in eight years. It may surprise you that a country like Poland is expected to build more offshore wind than any of the other countries. The expansion of renewable energy is a game changer also for hydrogen. Instead of importing Russian fuels, we can replace them with green hydrogen. The geopolitics of energy is changing before our eyes. Energy has been used as a weapon against Europe many times before. But today, we can use renewable energy as a shield to protect us and show the world that energy should not be used as a tool of oppression. 
but as a tool that can stem climate change and become a source of peace and prosperity. Don't go away. We'll be back looking how the richest countries on Earth can best help small island states and the global south. This is Forsaken Futures, brought to you by Project Syndicate. See you in a minute. We'll leave you with Thomas Burble, CEO of our sponsor, AXA. From a climate perspective, the insurance industry is uniquely poised to support the transition towards a resilient, net zero emissions economy and should use all available levers to do so. At AXA, we believe that a holistic approach for climate is key, tackling net zero across both the liability and asset side of our balance sheet. This way, we can deliver impact on climate, not only through our investment decisions, but also through our underwriting actions. In 2019, AXA joined the UNEP-FI-sponsored Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance to align our investment portfolio with a net zero trajectory by 2050. This led us to set an intermediary target to decrease the carbon footprint of AXA's general account assets by 20% by 2025. The insurance industry is also going one step further with the creation of the Net Zero Insurance Alliance, chaired by AXA, which focuses on the other side of the balance sheet. Like the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, the Net Zero Insurance Alliance extends carbon neutrality commitments to the insurance business. The objective is to establish a target setting protocol enabling the Net Zero Insurance Alliance members to individually align insurance portfolios with the Paris Agreement trajectory. The notion of just transition is essential. It lies on ensuring a reliable ecological transition while considering all the associated social and societal consequences. AXA is working both as an insurer and an investor. As investors, we focus on impactful projects through sustainable mid- and long-term investments integrated in dedicated funds. AXA is committed to reaching 26 billion euro in green investments by 2023. Investors are also on the storefront to decarbonate alternative assets, such as infrastructure and real estate, that is responsible for 40% of the world's carbon emission. As insurers, we need to protect by assessing the growing risks associated with global warming and by acting in favor of a transition through adapted solutions. For example, at DAXA Climate, we offer risk management and transition strategy consulting services to our corporate customers. Insurers are also committed to make protection to everyone, especially offering accessible services to the most vulnerable populations. AXA has already covered nearly 10.6 million people by 2021 with inclusive protection solutions. Finally, in both terms of investment and insurance, we need to identify and exclude activities that cannot be part of the transition and that are contrary to sustainability. AXA was the first insurer to announce a total divestment from the coal industry in the coming years. Our investments have already dropped by 90%. In this uncertain context, marked by global instability and inflation, both public and private stakeholders have the responsibility to work hand in hand to face today's global challenges. AXA is committed to deploying sustainable solutions and beyond that, we fully assume the leading role we must play in society.
The world has never been so rich, but we're still susceptible to shocks and crises. Can we build more resilient societies? Not utopian, but functioning and fair. This is the story of Earth for All. We assembled a group of economic thinkers and scientists and developed a computer model to test their big ideas. We then asked, what's possible in one generation? If we carry on as normal, population and material footprints continue to grow, particularly due to overconsumption in rich countries. The gap between the richest and everyone else widens. Social tensions worsen. Climate change impacts become ever worse. But what if the world takes a giant leap now, with five extraordinary turnarounds? In this possible and plausible future, all people can live a good life within safer planetary boundaries. We avoid the worst climate impacts. Poverty ends earlier. Population peaks lower. Well-being rises. Social tensions fall. Nature starts to heal. Incredibly, the investment needed is only 2 to 4% of global income. But we do need massive investments now, driven by governments on a clear mission to enact the turnarounds. Another big idea is a citizen's fund for each country, where companies pay to use our commons, the wealthiest contribute fairly, and the funds are distributed to all citizens equally. But rebooting economies won't happen on its own. We need a global movement, kicked off with worldwide citizens' assemblies. This is Earth for All. How the story ends is up to you. Join earthforall.life
Hello and welcome back to Forsaken Futures, brought to you by Project Syndicate. I'm Jo Coburn. Justice Underwater is the name of this, our second session of the day, where we'll be asking whether climate justice can move beyond the noisy demonstrations and into hard cash, reparation, mitigation and adaptation for the countries that have been hardest hit. We'll speak to our panel shortly, but first... Pakistan's climate minister says the bargain made between the global north and global south isn't working and that loss and danger to the south will have to be part of the bargain driven at COP27. But will it happen? Let's hear now from a young climate activist in Pakistan living in a region which has been devastated by the floodwaters. My name is Fatma Faraz Hoti. I am uh, 16 years old and I live in Peshawar. When the floods came, um, floods hit the cities and my village especially. Uh, we, we, it was, it was really scary for me to experience it, it and see it for the first time because uh, that the next morning when I was going to school, I saw a lot of people that were whose homes were displaced and they were living on the roadsides and there were so many tents around my school area and people were living over there. It was very scary to see their situation and how people are surviving. Pakistan is one of the most affected country by the climate crisis, yet most of the people don't even know what climate change is. The, the Western world especially, they can do a lot because Pakistan is a country that doesn't even emit much to the global uh, greenhouse gas emissions, yet we're being affected a lot by it. We're an agricultural country, so our GDP is totally dependent, our economy is dependent on the agriculture and climate change is directly threatening that. So if other countries, they come together and they help Pakistan, if, if it's not just in, in terms of financially helping Pakistan, but also in other ways by providing such uh, resources to the country that could help them make better, uh, better decisions about, uh, you know, the climate, about the environmental changes. So it, 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 they can play a role in it and, you know, the situation might get better. If one country is contributing much to this climate crisis, the other countries are also being affected. And Pakistan is one of the biggest examples for it, that we are being affected by it severely. So if, if um, everyone comes together and make policies for their own countries that are suitable for the environment and are eco-friendly, so we all can live in a better world. Powerful testimony there from 16-year-old Fatima from Peshawar in Pakistan. A reminder that we want to hear from you too. So skip to your socials and use the hashtag Forsaken Futures. And now to kick off this session, here's former president of Costa Rica, Laura Chinchilla. A painful lesson that humanity has learned from the last few decades is that the devastating effects of climate change are not equally distributed among countries, communities, and generations. While the climate crisis has negative implications for all of us, the poor and vulnerable are the first to suffer and the worst hit. In many countries in the Global South, women, elders, and children have been affected by climate change in a rather disproportionate way. Indigenous and poor families are disbanded into forced migration, searching for food and shelter, and trying to procure a future that will be otherwise impossible in their own lands. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, by 2030, 122 million people mostly the poorest 20% across 92 countries, could be pushed into extreme poverty by higher food prices and other 
climate driving income losses. Worsening the injustice, the biggest contributors to climate change are not necessarily those most affected by it. According to a recent report, the richest 1% of the global population accounts for twice the carbon emissions relative to the poorest 50%. These problems have made climate justice policies and strategies essential to tackle both global warming and inequalities. Policymakers must focus on ensuring a fairer distribution of obligations and duties, not just between nations, but also across segments of the population and between generations. Although concrete measures to deliver climate justice are well known, they have proved difficult to implement. Still, there are some promising signs in the right direction, like the steps being taken to define a new collective quantified goal on climate finance that should address the needs and priorities of developing countries and ensure that climate finance is accessible to those who need it most. These and other positive actions taken in various countries should encourage those who will submit in the framework of the Climate Change Conference, COP27, and the UN General Assembly. The challenge is to scale up all the efforts underway to win the race against the worst effects of climate change while leaving no one behind. Time to introduce our wonderful panel for this session. Mohamed Nasheed is former president of the Maldives and Speaker of Parliament. He's talking to us and joins us from Adu Atoll, the southernmost atoll of the Maldives, and rather excitingly, has a live audience. We may be able to show you. Uh, there they are. They can give us a wave, perhaps, um, sitting there in front of him. Um, they will be listening throughout. Um, Sandrine Dixon de Cleve is co-president of the Club of Rome. Bill McKibben, co-founder of 350.org, and Sharma Sanduye is a climate activist and a marine biologist from Mauritius. Welcome to all of you. Mohammed, I'm going to start with you as the former president of an island nation. Tell us, what does climate change mean to the people of the Maldives? Well, it does mean disaster for us, and um, of course it, it means it is an exist existential threat for us. Uh, our islands will disappear uh, if business goes as usual. Uh, climate change is already upon us. The bad weather has hit us. The winds are now stronger. The waves are higher. Uh, the rains are more. Uh, there is more flooding. There is more drought. It has completely changed. And this change has had a huge impact on us, uh, especially the economic loss the damage that we are now facing. So, you know, the, the whole idea of this seg segment, I suppose, is to talk about loss, uh, uh, climate change, the loss and damage. Now, we are now losing, and the question is, uh, how can others assist us uh, in mitigating or in trying to see that we, we, we can survive and we will be able to overcome the loss? Yes. Uh, if I, if I can um, kind of go and suggest a few more views that I have on this. Uh, firstly, uh, we've been right now, up until now, uh, talking about a lot of mitigation efforts. Mm. Uh, yes, we still do need that. But we are in the Maldives and in many climate vulnerable countries, the climate has already changed and the impact is now upon us and we are now losing. So we should now be talking about adaptation more, ever more than we've ever been mentioning it. Right, um, Mohammed, can past. I, yeah, well, can I just I interject just there? Because I just want to take you back um, quite a few years. I'm going to show some pictures that you might recognize, a press conference that you held rather extraordinarily underwater in 2009 to highlight these issues. And that's 2009. What would President Nasheed on that day in 2009 have thought if he'd had a crystal ball to see where things would end up today? 
Well, uh, uh, we even then in 2009, we wanted to impress the gravity of the issue uh, that we were facing and we were going to face. Now, it's only been uh, a few more years since 2009, a decade, and things have drastically changed. Mm. Uh, ev every year, the weather is getting worse and worse and worse. We are now spending 30% of our income on adaptation. And if you have a look at our countries, most of our countries are heavily debt ridden. And we are debt ridden, especially because we had built infrastructure, thinking that the bad weather is not going to come upon us, mm. but the bad weather has. So okay. we've, lost, we've, we've lost the road, we've lost the house, we've lost the school. Everything we have lost, but what, we, what remains right now is the debt. We took a loan to build all this infrastructure. And the bad weather has swept away the infrastructure, but the debt remains. Right. So it's really well, quite impossible for us to pay the debt now that bad weather has taken away the assets. Well, let me get some reaction from the other panellists. I mean, obviously, um, you know, painted there in extraordinarily stark colours um, by Mohammed uh, in terms of the situation in the Maldives. But Bill McKibben, is it too simple to say you broke it, you fix it to the rich countries of the world? Ah, just hold on one moment. I can't hear you. You might it's, be on mute. I'll start again. No, it's, it's not too simple at all. It's very much the situation that we're in. Uh, President Nasheed and I were both in the room in 2008 or 2009 at the Copenhagen Climate Conference when then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton promised that the Global North would be sending $100 billion to the Global South every year. That's, by all estimates now, a small fraction of the actual cost but the point is we haven't even gotten around to doing that yet. So I think that's why this is going to be at the top of the agenda when we get to Sharm el Sheikh in November. I think finally the fact that we're having a COP in Africa will really focus concentration on, on the, the imbalance between those who emit and those who pay the price. The entire continent of Africa is only responsible for about 2% of greenhouse gas emissions and yet they're paying an extraordinary price already in terms of loss and damage. So these questions have to be dealt with, and they have to be dealt with very fast. I mean, Sandrine Dixon de Clef, what is the link in your mind between climate change, poverty and inequality? Well, it's absolutely huge, and, and I think it's huge in a variety of ways. This is what we're trying to say in our new book that was just published last week, actually, with Johan Rockström and Jayati Ghosh and others very much clearly indicating that actually the root cause of many of these problems are the lack of distribution of wealth between the North and the South. And the fact that actually we are, as Western countries, the greatest polluters, and yet the, those that are suffering the most are the ones that actually are contributing the least, exactly as Bill has indicated. So we need to look at not just the unjust climate impacts, but the lack of equality and also poverty issues that have been growing across the globe and have not been addressed. Uh, if, if we look, for example, also at the impacts that we're seeing from climate related impacts of weather, we can see that this is hitting the most vulnerable groups, even in the West. So our argumentation has to be now in terms of damage and loss that one, we need to start protecting those that are most vulnerable because we are as vulnerable as the most vulnerable link. And secondly, that we need to really honor our pledges, as Bill was indicating, coming from the West to those countries that are going to be suffering the most. Let us remind everyone that in Pakistan, this is one of many mm. unbelievably difficult events that have occurred recently with regard to climate related weather and 33 million people have actually been affected by the floods and yet pakistan is only responsible for one percent of global emissions how is that possible 
Right. Well, actually, I think we can show you, certainly in a moment or so, some pictures from the devastation of the floods. Here they are um, in Pakistan. It was quite extraordinary, actually, to see the devastation unfolding there. Um, Shama Sanduye, you've listened to what the other three panellists have said, but with perhaps Pakistan in mind because it is so recent. Um, what is your response, particularly from the perspective of younger generations? Um, for me, for what I would say is that um, we don't have the same privilege as we had long ago to be focusing on mitigation measures. Um, from what I'm seeing, um, the same case that is happening in, in Maldives and other islands also happening to Mauritius, we are having extreme climatic events. And the problem is that with these extreme climatic events, there are other things that are affected by the climate crisis. We are talking about the healthcare system. We are talking about epidemics. We are talking about the food system, food security. We're talking about the way of living of the people and stuff. So what I think is that these, the way that the finances for the climate, they are going, they are not working for now. Um, they have not been working for the previous years and they are still not working. Um, I would like to point out that when we talk about the climate crisis, uh, as you mentioned previously, as several mm. panelists mentioned previously, we're talking about injustice, about countries who are not emitting as much as other countries, but who are paying the consequences. And um, one thing that I would like, like to come to is the loss and damage uh, compensations and stuff. The problem is that um, it uh, somehow says that, OK, we accept the damage, but we will try to take care of it afterwards. So there are two things that we need to understand uh, that the people need and want from uh, the global south. First of all, we want a safe climate. We want a safe future. And when we, what we mean by a safe future with a safe climate is that we are not scared. We don't have anxiety about the food security in the next 10, 20 years. We are not anxious about the, um, the consequences of floods, of droughts. We are not anxious about epidemics rising up again because of floods of other uh, extreme climatic events. So that's one thing that we want. But of course, the other thing that we need right now is, um, unfortunately, we need it. Uh, the money for, for adaptation, mm. like um, like the president said earlier, we we really need this this finances for adaptation because we've come to a point where, I mean, that's what I meant when talking about privileges of long ago. We could yes. mitigate the consequences of the climate crisis, but now we've come to a point where we can no longer mitigate. We need to adapt our system to it. We need to adapt our food security system to it. All right. And well, let, let let me just bring Bill back in here because Bill, those pictures that we were looking at that. Sharma has also responded to, but saying we've gone past the, the stage of mitigation. I mean, if you're looking at those pictures that happened last month, what, what exactly could be done by rich countries to help those people in that situation? Well, first of all, let's be clear. There continues to be a grave need for mitigation, by which we mean a grave need for the rapid transition off fossil fuel and onto renewable energy. If we don't, the current one degree increase in temperature is going to be a two or three degree increase in temperature and tragedies like the ones in Pakistan will just be what happens every day everywhere. Um, so that continues to be important. But in the meantime, there's no getting around the fact that we're already deep into the climate age and change is happening in painful ways. Job one in that case is immediate relief. But job two is helping make these countries provide the funding to make these countries resilient enough to deal with what's coming at them. So, you know, that doesn't mean, I mean, this week we have to deliver food to people who don't have any in Pakistan. Yeah. But in the next year, we have to be able to start making places like Pakistan as resilient as possible against how? the how flooding. Do you, how do you do that? Well I, mean, you, well, I mean, you start building things. I mean, we, you know, it's very clear that there's lots of work to be done on things like drainage in Pakistan. In places like the Maldives, there are going to have to be uh, ways to, say, raise up the, the airport so that people can right. continue to get in and out. Uh, you know, just on and on and on around the world, there's an extraordinary amount of infrastructure that can't cope with a one or two meter rise in sea level, that okay. can't cope with an extraordinary increase in the rate of rain, that needs to be able to, you know, we need a uh, 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 drought resistant agriculture in place. All of this stuff costs money. Mm. None of it's impossible, though it'll become impossible if we let the temperature get too high. But where we are right now, we have to do both these things. 
keep right. the temperature from getting higher and buffer the, the damage that we're already causing. Uh, right, Mohammed, do you agree with what you've just heard from Bill in terms of making um, countries, islands like the Maldives more, more resilient? Well, yes, uh, I, I think uh, we are very clear on what we are looking for and what we think needs to be done. Most climate vulnerable countries are extremely debt ridden. And we need to restructure our debt so that we can swap debt to climate conservation. And this is, you know, in a sense, let's say we owe China $100 million. And tomorrow we are going to say, sorry, we can't pay. Sri Lanka yesterday said, oh, sorry, they can't pay. Pakistan is going to say, we are sorry that we can't pay. So someone, the creditor, is going to lose all that money. And a bank, IMF and the World Bank, we would like the bank to go to the creditor and tell the creditor, actually, these debtor nations can pay something. They can pay 70%. Mm. If, the creditor nation, if the creditor nation is willing to ask the debtor nation, in this case, the Maldives or Sri Lanka or Pakistan, to have a haircut, 30% of their debt in their local currency and in a fund that would be looked after by the bank, by the debtor country and mm. by the credit country and that fund to be spent on climate resilient projects. So basically debt restructuring. Yeah. Well, Sandrine, listening to that, I mean, is that an idea have, and a proposal have... worth considering? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in fact, we have to think of several things. The first is that the new report actually from the Global Commission on Adaptation has indicated very clearly that one dollar invested in adaptation could yield up to ten dollars in net economic benefits. So we need to think about adaptation exactly as Bill has indicated and ensure that we shift capital towards adaptation while we're also creating the capital that we need and shifting it to mitigation. We need to do both. But for the moment, we have 20% going into adaptation and only an 80% going into mitigation. And so we do need to look at both a bit more equally because we are in the midst of a series of different crises. And the other key point that needs to be brought up with regard to debt cancellation is that both there is debt cancellation, there is also discussion around debt for nature swaps or debt for carbon swaps. There are a variety of ways in which we need to address trade deficits and debt within the southern countries, what we're calling actually most of the world, and think through very clearly how these countries are cash strapped and are having difficulty in making sure that they can build that resilience that Bill was referring to, because building resilience is absolutely fundamental. Maybe one last point in terms of building that resilience. Yes. This is why we need to think more clearly around how we restructure our economies. We've been speaking in Earth for All, a survival guide for humanity, very clearly around we need to start talking about the elephant in the room, taxing the 1% wealthiest across mm -hmm. the globe, but also nationally. We need to think about how we can ensure that low-income countries have at least annual income of about 15,000 US dollars. And we need to think at the same time of how do we put in the right stability boards and loss and damage financing facilities to ensure that actually while we are adapting and while we are shifting our economic structures and architectures, we are compensating for loss and damage. Right. Well, let's put some of the figures, if you like, and the proposals that you have outlined um, as panellists to, to Sharma and also in perspective of what's been announced in the UK. One of the first moves by the British Prime Minister Liz Truss last week was to announce something in the region of a £100 billion package to the British people. That's what we assume it will add up to with their energy bills. Now, that's a larger amount than the entire amount promised in Copenhagen by rich countries. So, Sharma, honestly speaking, would you agree with the idea that perhaps the problem is that the rich just don't care enough about the rest of the world, the rich countries? Um, I think that it's a series of, uh, of issues and that part where the rich communities that are polluting the most and contributing the most to the greenhouse gases, of course, they don't care about what's happening. Um, so what I would like to say, um, bouncing off what Sandrine has been explaining, um, we, for example, in Mauritius, we are kind of trapped in a jail 
because uh, same as Maldives, we also have lots of debts. And the problem is that in small islands, we are not, uh, we don't have enough resources in terms of uh, expertise, in terms of finances, but also because we are trapped in this loop where we need to do something for the country, we need to do something for the economy. And the problem is that these small islands, they are very much the praise of the rich people. Um, so the rich people, they invest in these countries to have luxury villas, to build mm -hmm. uh, luxurious um, uh, buildings or I don't know what. And the problem <laughs> is that when they do this, they don't even care about uh, the problems that this country is facing in terms of the environment, in terms of the ecology or the climate. For example, that's something that's happening a lot in Mauritius, especially post-COVID, where the situation, the financial situation in Mauritius is getting really um, serious. So the government is, the, he has no option. I'm not defending their government, of course, but their only option is to welcome private companies, wealthy people, to attract them in Mauritius, to invest um, in building hotels, in building villas, to come and live in Mauritius, and uh, even private companies, oil companies. That's the problem because the government is trapped in a loop. So they mm. are now passing a bill to exploit the oil and private companies, they are like in deal with government. So right, this is well, the whole jail of, like... Yeah, no, you no, you've explained it very clearly. And actually, perhaps another example of this, um, Mohammed Nasheed, perhaps I could get you to comment on this. These are pictures here uh, that we're going to show you of the rainforests of the Congo Basin. Um, and back at COP26 in Glasgow, the Democratic Republic of Congo endorsed a 10 year plan to protect them. However, earlier this year, the government opened the door to oil exploitation. Now, the country's climate lead, Tosi Mapanu Mapanu, is on the record as saying, our priority is not to save the planet. Do we need more action from across the world, not just the richest countries? Well, yes, we have all, we have to all chip in. Uh, there's no doubt about it. We have to find a low carbon development strategy, a development strategy that is less extractive and more recycling. And I think it's, it's possible to find that strategy. And I also believe that it is beneficial for our countries uh, to have a development uh, method or uh, a development process that does uh, that is sustainable uh, and that allows us to also look after our planet. But you know, going back to our, our our bigger issue of adaptation, in the Maldives, it costs us eight thousand dollars to save one meter of shoreline. The breakwater outside is $4,000 a meter, and the embankment inside is $3,000 a meter. Now, we have 2,000 islands. India alone has 7,500 kilometers of shoreline. So it's just simply not possible to protect the shoreline through this engineering. I think uh, it's very important that we find more natural ways of adaptation how we may be able to use nature as infrastructure and therefore try to save our coastline through that. I am told that to grow a reef, it takes $20 a meter. To implant a mangrove, it's $5 a meter. The problem is the reef is taking too long to grow. So mm. we need science to it. We, I, I believe we need to genet genetically modify the polyp. We have to find a resilient species that would protect our shorelines. And I think that's where the money is lacking. Okay. Uh, well, if, 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 we, if I go and ask the rich countries to give mm. us adaptation money for breakwaters and embankments, they don't have that money. You, you mentioned a huge amount just now on 100 billion. Now, yes. this adaptation work for the whole coastline of the planet goes into many, many trillions. We have to find the science. We are spending, the Maldives is spending 30% of its income on adaptation. We didn't do this, but we are spending 30% of our income on adaptation and yes. another 25% on debt repayment. We have nothing for education. We have nothing for health. We have, we have nothing for development. We really are stuck. Climate vulnerable countries are going to default, go into default one after the other. The right. biggest risk of climate change would be debt default. 
Okay, well, look, let, uh, you know, it, it, it's clear that the experience, your experience on the Maldives sort of encapsulates um, the critical end and impact of climate change. But your appeal to the Western democracies and richer countries, I mean, Bill, is there a danger of kicking Western governments too hard? I mean, many of the countries reducing their emissions the most or investing largely in green technology are in the West. Many of them, like the UK, will say they've achieved a great deal. And while the loss and damage funding commitments may be falling short, billions are being spent elsewhere. Well, first of all, let's just be clear about how much or how little the rich countries are doing, even on mitigation. Uh, the UK just announced they're back in the fracking business. And the new Secretary of Energy says he wants to get every last cubic meter of gas up out of the North Sea. That's pretty disgusting. Um, but I don't think there's any danger of hitting too hard. Just the opposite. People in the North have very little idea yet of exactly uh, uh, how, you know, what the, where justice lies here. It's one reason that President Nasheed's proposal about debt cancellation is shown so important. If nothing else, it will be a loud wake up call to get people in the global north understanding what's going on, especially those people who uh, uh, run banks and those are powerful people. So the sooner it happens and the louder it happens, the better it is for everyone. Well, um, Sharma, I'm going to show everyone um, a clip now of the UK's COP president, Alok Sharma. Just just take a listen. I apologize for the way this process has unfolded, um, and uh, I'm deeply sorry. I also understand the, the deep disappointment, but I think as you have noted, it's also vital that we um, protect this package. Summer, he was visibly upset um, at the end of COP26 uh, last year in Glasgow, Alok Sharma, saying that the package that was agreed didn't go nearly far enough. Do you still have faith in the process? Bill earlier said that he feels that actually holding it um, in Africa will make a massive difference. Do you think the process still stands? Well, uh, I... Uh, oh, I was me? going. To, oh no, I was going to ask Sharma first, but I can come to you in just a moment, Sharma. Yeah, and I'd love. Sorry. I'd love to reflect as well. Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, I'm not very positive about it because, um, for example, the previous COP, the, the the last one that happened in Glasgow, it showed us um, that the priority of the of the officials of the of the Western countries and governments they are not in the climate, and uh, the COP to, the COP events have become unfortunately more like an indus industrial event more than anything else. Um, I'm talking from a Mauritian perspective as well. The Mauritian Prime Minister assisted to the COP26 in Glasgow and just a few weeks before that he presented the offshore petroleum bill in Parliament and this bill is um, allowing private companies, international companies to remove oil from our oceans. Um, and just that happened just a few weeks before class, before COP26, and he went there and he was talking about how islands need uh, money for compensation, for mitigation, adaptation, and everything to become more resilient. Um, so I think that for me, the COPs, they are not really moving anything, as they should anyway, because that's the reality that we see from the ground. The money that are that are coming from the from the cups and everything, they are not mm. reaching the communities that actually need it. And I'm not very optimistic about the COP27 in uh, Egypt because um, Egypt is not a climate champion. They are not a champion in climate crisis, but also because it does not fully represent the whole image of Africa. Um, the, what is happening in Egypt and what is happening in Ethiopia are completely different. And mm. it doesn't mean that the, the, the governments, um, not just governments, but these countries from the global south have enough resources to go to Egypt and to voice out about what's happening and stuff. For example, we have other troubles like visa and everything. Okay. So it poses some barriers. Um, yeah. Bill, I know you've got to leave um, pretty immediately, but before you go, a comment on COP27 and your faith in it. Well, look, I mean, this process has been long drawn out, you know, horribly inefficient, um, and no one should think that the cops are going to be the thing that rescues us. They're a place to talk about the trouble that we're in and a place to make the kind of uh, dramatic gesture that President Nasheed is talking about that'll then have to reverberate 
within Congress's parliaments and boardrooms in order to get real change happening. So the COP will be a forum, it won't solve anything, uh, but what will solve things is what always does. Movements of people rising up, governments standing up for themselves and what they need. It's going to be a rocky few years, but it's, there's no way around it. And so I'm very glad to see these kind of proposals coming from great leaders like President Nasheed and from everybody else. I apologize for having to leave. Uh, I'm en route to do some more campaigning, but many, many thanks to everybody for your good work. No, thank you for joining us for the time you had. Uh, that's Bill McKibben, the co-founder of 350.org. Goodbye to you. Um, Mohammed Nasheed, let's get your response to uh, your hopes for COP27 and whether you still believe in the process. Well, it's very difficult to now believe in it because this is the 26th time that Conference of the Parties are meeting. So yeah. obviously there's something wrong with it. You know, the last time I went to COP, I met Cop children. Negotiators had got married to each other from both countries, and there were children who were in their late early teens. Now, but we still don't have a legally binding agreement. We still haven't found a, a mechanism through which we can deliver adaptation funding to resilient to, to climate vulnerable countries. Um, we must find uh, there is we, we must reform the UNFCCC process. As it is now, if, let's say, two countries agree and another third country comes in and says, I don't agree, you know what happens according to COP? The two countries that agreed reduce their ambition to the third country. So we are now trying to find the lowest common denominator. And that wouldn't save the planet. If we want to save the planet, willing countries, countries who are who has high ambition, who wants to actually get things done, I think they should get together, agree among themselves, and do what they can do. We can't find an agreement that, that fulfills every single nation. Not possible. Sandrine, your reaction? I, I couldn't agree more with the last two speakers, I, I, and Chama as well. I think that really the problem now, it, we've had far too many COPs, far too many pledges, far too many promises. We need to recall the governments to action, and we need to get those governments that are ambitious together and absolutely put forward clear targets and timetables. What I find incredible is the fact that we have such a lack of joined up thinking and acting. When we see that on the one hand, we're clearly trying to pull out a fossil because we know that we have to shift from our extractive economy and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And yet we see the continuation of that extractive economy, mostly for short term profits. And at the same time, what we're seeing more and more in all of the analysis that we have is it's the social tipping points the fact that we're going to have increased climate migration, the fact that we're going to have parts of the world that will no longer be able to produce food and that will be very much hit by further climate weather uh, impacts. So all of this lack of joined up thinking, this continuous rush towards short term knee jerk mm. reactions, we see it here also in Europe with the fact that our ODA has now been shifted predominantly to a growth in military budgets and to a growth of obviously the Ukrainian situation and the invasion, which we know is absolutely essential to try to solve. But yet, at the same time, we see all of the impacts from climate. So I think that what we need to do at COP and what we should be doing is unbelievably putting together everyone. And by the way, it's very clear that we will not have non-state actors working as closely as they have in the past with mm. state actors because there will be restrictions between the blue and the green zone and this is a real problem but if we were able to get everyone together to start thinking of short-term actions damage and loss ensuring that we do shift some capital where it needs to go right now for adaptation while at the same time being able to build solidarity with those zones that are in conflict for the moment because it is the compound effects of the three C's, the climate, the COVID, and also the conflict that is going to hit people the hardest. 
We need intelligent people to join up and think through what are going to be both the social and environmental impacts of our actions and our policies. Well, that was a passionate call to action uh, there. Sandrine, thank you very much. Thank you to all of you. It's a good time um, to introduce our journalists who have questions for the three of you. Um, let's start with Dr. Olukayode Oyelaya, uh, consulting editor at Business AM in Nigeria. Please go ahead with your question. All right, thank you. My question is this. Um, how, in all of these problems now, how do we get these um, actors to come to a consensus and what kind of compromises would, should we be looking at if indeed we want to have a, you know, a holistic global solution to all this climate crisis that we're talking about? Let me put that first of all to uh, Mohammed Nasheed. Well, again, you know, I am sorry, I do not think that we will be able to get an agreement that satisfies every single person on this planet or every single country. Uh, I would still argue that we must find an alliance of the willing and go ahead, go ahead. I think we should, those who are willing to do something, must start doing and not wait until the other country does it. Um, I, I believe that renewable energy is now cheaper than fossil fuel in any given situation. And I believe that there is vertical farming there is all sorts of new gadgets, there's new technology that we can find a development strategy that is less extractive, extractive and more recycling. So I, I kind of believe that changing, changing to the new economy, changing to the blue economy would be beneficial for developing countries. Uh, you know, internal combustion engine, engine is a Victorian technology. Why yes. do we want all right. Shama? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, what I would like to say about that is that there is no one solution for the climate crisis, but there is the scientific community that are reporting what is happening and what needs to be done. They are suggesting solutions. And um, uh, I, would, I would like to mention once again something that Sandrine said earlier is about taxing the rich people because... Um, polluters pay principal and also they are the ones that are emitting the most. So that's one, one way of doing it is by starting to decolonize the wealth from the small percentage of people around the planet who has the most money and also who are polluting the most. Um, decolonizing that wealth but also looking at the science and listening to what the science is saying, protecting the ecosystems, uh, abandoning fossil fuel protecting uh, specific ecosystems like wetlands, um, forest, the ocean, protecting yes. the ocean, the high seas. Um, I would think that listening to the science community is, would be a really good step forward, but also including the local communities because they are the ones uh, who are on the front lines and they are the ones who are uh, receiving all the problems uh, related oh. to the climate. We have time for one more question from Musa Mir, Associate Editor at Bonik Barter in Bangladesh. Please go ahead with your question. In a country like Bangladesh, adaptation policy making is largely top down, amenable to techno marginal solution and not inclusive of marginalized actors. Adaptation policy making that serves the powerful uh, may not facilitate adaptation for marginalized population, perhaps even further interesting their vulnerability to climate change. In this situation, many programs designed that are bad for the environment and, and also the uh, people. Uh, right. How do powering approach influence the climate change adaptation policy design and implementation process? Um, Sandrine, I don't know if you could catch all of that because the line was a little bit unstable. I will just try and sort of um, paraphrase. Um, okay. As we know, Bangladesh is experiencing significant loss and damage as a result of, of climate mm. change. What can it do to tackle these challenges alone? What can its larger, richer neighbours like India and China do to help? We haven't got much time, but I'll hand it over to you. I think there is first the damage and loss facility that actually Salim Hawk, who is Bangladeshi and one of the great thinkers around building resilience on damage and loss is absolutely fundamental. Uh, creating the fund that we've been promised also around damage and loss and bringing more countries to the fore than just Scotland and the region of Wallonia and a few others that have agreed to put aside funds for damage and loss. But let me just add a few other things that need to happen. One, we need to start thinking about deeper shifts within our institutional frameworks. We need to look at the IMF and the World Trade Organization. The IMF in terms of how they allocate 
funding to the low income countries. And we've been calling for at least one trillion per annum for green jobs, creating investments, both in terms of adaptation and mitigation. Trade re-regionalization, for example, we were asking the rich countries and the World Trade Organization to allow local production of fledgling industries and to really create South-South intellectual exchange, making sure that we've also got leapfrogging and intellectual property rights waivers that are put in place. We know that we've got many of these technologies. We need to triple our investment in renewables and also triple the investment in adaptation at the same time. All Those right. are some of the things that need to happen. Maybe one last thought is we've been asking for countries to declare a planetary emergency and then to put in place planetary emergency plans. These plans very much take into consideration protecting the global commons and also ensuring that we have a human dimension so we don't have social tipping points. That's all the buffers that we're starting to see even here in Europe okay. with regard to energy checks, poverty checks, etc. Thank you to Sandrine. Thank you to all of our guests for a fascinating uh, discussion there. That's the former president of the Maldives, Mohamed Nasheed, Sandrine Dixon de Clerve, Bill McKibben, who left a little earlier, and Sharma Sandouye. Now, before the break, let's reflect on some of the things we've been talking about. Daniel Beltra is a Spanish photographer and artist whose work focuses on the impact of humanity on the environment. Here's his report from the front line of the climate crisis. When I was a, a young photographer, I used to think that we could change everything and, and revert to the, to the good ways, you know, revert to a more healthy environment. And now we think what we need to do is avoid a, the consequences of very serious catastrophe. As a, a first hand witness of the devastation provoked by the deep water horizon, uh, oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, that poured over 5 million barrels of oil in the Gulf of Mexico. I was flying on a small airplane. Uh, the stench up in the air was absolutely horrible. And you can think also of what went precipitated underwater. So there's a photo there that, that became very well known of the, of the spill, which is that group of pelicans that are covered in oil in a facility where they're going to be cleaned. And they're sitting on what was a white sheet. They've been sprayed with, uh, with a light oil and they start dripping all that heavy oil. No, it, it was a horrible uh, catastrophe to, to witness. The destruction of, of the Amazon happens on, on many fronts at once, and the fires are, are staggering. And there's uh, over 100,000 fires a year. And we reached the point where the carbon emissions uh, for the, from the rainforest are bigger than the carbon sequestration, than the carbon that is absorbed by the, by the trees. No? So we're reaching a, a, a tipping point. There's also many indigenous populations that uh, uh, call the rainforest their, their house. No, and we're invading uh, uh, the forest. Uh, there's, a, there's a portrait I took of a, an Awenenawe tribe member in, in Brazil near Juina. And these guys were contacted for the first time in the, in the 70s. Uh, till then, they lived the same way for centuries, you know, for thousands of years. But, uh, but since then, everything changes incredibly rapidly. There's an image of a, of a ship, a typical Brazilian boat, a river boat, that got stranded in a sandbar. The water started receding and they got trapped there and the crew was living in the boat, I don't know, for months till the water uh, came back. No, and the changes were incredible. Millions of dead fish because the oxygen levels on the river uh, uh, were depleted. There's that other images that show the, the beauty and the, the pristine beauty of the canopy and its richness and the amount of species that are, are there. No? So it's a, it's a jewel, jewel that we should uh, uh, protect. Uh, the first time I went to document uh, uh, global warming issues in the Arctic was in the late 90s. And uh, I uh, found the uh, Inuit population that, for example, were losing uh, their ability to store food because their ice cellars will get flooded in the summer. The permafrost was melting. The Arctic could be ice free in less than 20 years. Uh, we've lost over 95% of the old ice. All that ice that was there for thousands of years is completely gone. So in Antarctica, again, the ice shelves, you know, we have the biggest amount of ice there. If that goes, we, we will be talking about many meters of sea level rise. It will not affect us right now, but definitely in hundreds of years for the populations of the future. 
people doubt that these things are happening, I, I jokingly say they, they should come with me because definitely it's impossible to doubt that climate change is happening, that all these impacts occur when you see them in first hand. No? So I hope to convey that. I think if we have an opportunity to solve things, it comes through education. Greenland uh, was always seen a bit as the, the, the canary in the coal mine. And uh, the first time I went there in 2014, uh, I was expecting a, a landscape of, uh, of white and ice and what I found was a horrible landscape of uh, melting and uh, dark snow and rivers of, and lakes of water that happened all over the surface. So there's an image of, uh, of a little bit of snow left on a cliff and a very small piece of ice floating off, uh, on the water that feels a bit like a metaphor of what could come if we're not careful. So I hope my work helps inspire people uh, to change things for better. Those hugely powerful photographs and testimony of Daniel Beltra. I just want to say a special thank you too to the live audience in the Adu Atoll. There they are in the Maldives with the former president of the Maldives, Mohamed Nasheed. Thank you very much for joining us today. Now don't go anywhere because we'll be back to answer everything you ever wanted to know about geoengineering and whether it could be the answer to bringing down rising temperatures.
The world has never been so rich, but we're still susceptible to shocks and crises. Can we build more resilient societies? Not utopian, but functioning and fair. This is the story of Earth for All. We assembled a group of economic thinkers and scientists and developed a computer model to test their big ideas. We then asked, what's possible in one generation? If we carry on as normal, population and material footprints continue to grow, particularly due to overconsumption in rich countries. The gap between the richest and everyone else widens. Social tensions worsen. Climate change impacts become ever worse. But what if the world takes a giant leap now, with five extraordinary turnarounds? In this possible and plausible future, all people can live a good life within safer planetary boundaries. We avoid the worst climate impacts. Poverty ends earlier. Population peaks lower. Well-being rises. Social tensions fall. Nature starts to heal. Incredibly, the investment needed is only 2 to 4% of global income. But we do need massive investments now driven by governments on a clear mission to enact the turnarounds. Another big idea is a citizen's fund for each country, where companies pay to use our commons, the wealthiest contribute fairly, and the funds are distributed to all citizens equally. But rebooting economies won't happen on its own. We need a global movement, kicked off with worldwide citizens' assemblies. This is Earth for All. How the story ends is up to you. Join earthforall.life
The world has never been so rich, but we're still susceptible to shocks and crises. Can we build more resilient societies? Not utopian, but functioning and fair. This is the story of Earth for All. We assembled a group of economic thinkers and scientists and developed a computer model to test their big ideas. We then asked, what's possible in one generation? If we carry on as normal, population and material footprints continue to grow, particularly due to overconsumption in rich countries. The gap between the richest and everyone else widens. Social tensions worsen. Climate change impacts become ever worse. But what if the world takes a giant leap now, with five extraordinary turnarounds? In this possible and plausible future, all people can live a good life within safer planetary boundaries. We avoid the worst climate impacts. Poverty ends earlier. Population peaks lower. Well-being rises. Social tensions fall. Nature starts to heal. Incredibly, the investment needed is only 2 to 4% of global income. But we do need massive investments now, driven by governments on a clear mission to enact the turnarounds. Another big idea is a citizens fund for each country, where companies pay to use our commons, the wealthiest contribute fairly, and the funds are distributed to all citizens equally. But rebooting economies won't happen on its own. We need a global movement, kicked off with worldwide citizens' assemblies. This is Earth for All. How the story ends is up to you. Join earthforall.life
Welcome back to our final session of the day, Code Green, where we'll try and end the day on a more positive note, looking at solutions. First up, 50 years ago, the Club of Rome published a seminal work on humanity's impact on the planet. Today, it has an updated guide to surviving climate change. Let's have a look. The Club of Rome is a group of scientists, humanists, educators, It's irritating that humanity has not listened to us, but they haven't. The warning bells were there already 50 years ago. The big difference is that now we truly are in the midst of the crises. We are much, much closer to, um, to potentially catastrophic outcomes. Now we have a short opportunity where everything is up in the air. We thought it was the time to now reassess to see what does science tell us today and how does the future look like the next 50 years. We have to change the story. We have to provide a plausible, coherent, consistent and also science-based and numbers-backed story that people find more attractive than business as usual. We have one scenario called too little, too late. And then the other one is where we succeed in putting all those possibilities together. We are proposing five turnarounds paid for by the 10% richest people in the world. If we put in place the five turnarounds that we talk about, the focusing on inequality, the focus on poverty, the focus on empowerment, and then food and energy as the two key resources that will keep us alive, as we're faced with some of these ongoing crises, then we actually could get ourselves out of this mess. And the interesting thing with these five turnarounds is that they can be scaled from communities to cities to sectors, nations, regions, and then globally. So that's what we were looking for, like a fractal, set of fractals that escalate or percolate down from the global economic system all the way down to specific communities. We need to start with redressing, making sure that the solution is fair, is perceived as fair by a democratic majority. Unless we do so, we won't get a solution. It's critical we talk about poverty because the poorest in societies um, are the most vulnerable and face the biggest risks, as we can see with the, the flooding in Pakistan, and we can see with the food crisis in sub-Saharan Africa. It's absolutely critical that um, we use this as an opportunity to, um, to spur um, sustainable economic development. We need to start to address population growth. And in addressing population growth, we need to ensure that men also empower women and that women then and girls can have access to education, that they can be part of the decision-making process and start to feel fulfilled in their lives in order to ensure that then population numbers will start to reduce. In the food system, we would see a rapid change towards uh, more logistics that reduce the unnecessary food waste and food loss so that we have food security. I'm absolutely convinced that the Ukraine war will help us to accelerate the transition away from oil, coal and natural gas. So we could see an energy democracy where local sources, microgrids, local areas don't have to rely so much on the global fossil energy system. What we're facing is not an environmental crisis. It's a crisis of, of security, of stability, of prosperity and equity. And, and, and that's what Earth for All really brings forward. What this book is trying to do is give some direction 
to policymakers to say if you actually implement these five key turnarounds with some of these very clear policy recommendations, we can start to see a difference. I'm fairly optimistic that we are going to see um, a very, very rapid transformation. But the question is, will it be fast enough? So the overall object of the latest report is basically to continue the fight. Now we need to come together and we need to share this image that a giant leap is fully possible. That comes back to a series of different structural shifts that we will have to make across the globe in order to ensure that we have truly an Earth for all. The German version of Earth for All, a survival guide for humanity, is out now in German. And the English language version will be released in just a few days' time on the 20th of September. Now, one other solution that many of us might not know that much about is geoengineering, human interventions that can change the Earth's climate system, hopefully for the better. In China, they're waging war on the weather, a drought so severe they're firing rockets into the sky to make it rain. Dubai is making it rain in a sweltering desert by zapping clouds with electricity using drones. The world's biggest industrial complex to extract carbon dioxide from the air has opened in Iceland. It showcases a developing technology considered by some to be an important tool in the fight against climate change. Who better now to talk us through the issues than two people who know everything there is to know about geoengineering. Marcia McNutt, President of the National Academy of Sciences, and Carlo Ratti, Professor at MIT. Marcia, over to you. Well, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> I have to say that film was uh, quite uh, scary. And I think it does a good job of showing that we are at a crossroads right now. Let me tell you what my intersection has been with geoengineering. And I have to say, I'm a little bit embarrassed to be called an expert on it because I'm certainly not. But um, I probably can give enough of an overview to the audience today. Uh, years ago, the National Academy wrote a report on geoengineering. And the committee that met really preferred the term climate intervention to geoengineering. And climate intervention includes topics such as um, CO2 capture from the atmosphere to reduce the greenhouse effect. And it also included various uh, methods for reflecting sunlight uh, away from Earth in order to reduce the incoming solar radiation. Now, the reason why this committee preferred the term climate intervention is, I think, uh, fairly easy to understand. If an engineer is asked to build a bridge and they end up building a dam, that's not the right outcome. So for most people, engineering implies a precision in the outcome, which the committee felt was illusory in terms of geoengineering. There are many ways we can interfere in the climate system, but it is not with enough scientific knowledge to precisely predict the outcome. Whereas if I do an intervention in my uh, cousin's divorce, 
well, the intervention could be positive or it could backfire on me. And so we felt intervention was the right term for any of these methods that uh, humans use to intentionally change the climate, um, knowing that there are probably going to be unintended outcomes that we can't foresee right now. For that reason, the main uh, recommendation from this committee was that uh, geoengineering should not be pursued right now, but we should study it enough so that if we get to a crisis point with our backs against the wall and there's no other option for avoiding the absolute worst impacts of climate change, we will at least reach that point with the knowledge of whether any of these mechanisms for geoengineering actually uh, are better than facing unabated climate change alone. So maybe I'll, I'll pass over to Carlo now to say a few things about his work at MIT on this topic. Thank you. Well, thank you, Martian. What we what uh, what have been doing is really along the lines of what you were saying. First of all, let me say what we do at MIT primarily is focus on cities. But cities are really very connected with climate change. You know, just remember four numbers about cities, 255, 75, and 80. Cities are a small fraction of the planet, only 2%, but around 55% of the population, 75% of energy consumption, 80% of CO2 emissions. So really in our work with cities, we've been dealing with uh, with human interventions, if you want, with with, uh, with urban areas, they are very, very linked with, uh, with CO2 emissions and climate change. And clearly what we are doing at MIT, we are looking at cities as complex systems. We got you know, people coming, of course, from architecture, planning, design, but also from complex sciences, from engineering, from computer science, and clearly also from the social sciences. Looking at all these kind of three vectors, the vector of design, uh, the vector of tech, different type of technologies, and also the, the vector, the human vector, again, dealing with the, with the social sciences. And so we've been doing this now for almost 20 years and, you know, really work with mayors and cities globally. But over the past two to three years, we really grew increasingly concern. And again, cities are so crucial. Most mayors have committed, have pledged, are committed, for instance, to become net zero carbon by 2050. There's an association of cities called C40. It puts together, brings together the around 100 biggest cities on the planet. You know, they committed to be net zero carbon by 2050 or earlier, some cities 2040 or 2035. But yet what we are seeing is incredible difficulties in order to implement adaptation and mitigation, in order to do this at scale and to do it fast enough. And that's when we, together with a number of colleagues at MIT, clearly if you want to do this every possible intervention or geoengineering project needs to bring together people from many different disciplines. Then what we, we've been doing with, uh, with a large number of colleagues coming from all the way from Aero Astro to architecture to design to different parts of engineering, something like, you know, it's not to start implementing anything, but it would be good to start researching something that if other things were to fail, at least, you know, we know what we might, uh, might be doing. And so that's what we've been doing over the past few years, looking in particular, I believe, at what also the report from the National Academies highlighted, which is one particular type of uh, geoengineering, uh, which is solar geoengineering, about reducing a little bit incoming radiation so we can counter uh, climate change. Well, wonderful, Carlo. Thank you for that uh, summary. Perhaps for people in the audience who might not know much about geoengineering, uh, let me give just a, a quick tour through some of the methods. Now, one method of geoengineering that Carlo was just talking about is um, reducing the amount of incoming solar radiation through artificial means. One uh, technology that the National Academies Committee looked at was putting big mirrors into space, just putting mirrors up there and letting them reflect uh, the sun away from Earth. Uh, for the most part, that mechanism was thought to be um, incredibly expensive and probably not very um, feasible in terms of uh, actually implementing. One that we know would probably be very cheap 
And in fact, in some cases, cheaper than mitigation by reducing the amount of CO2 or adaptation is uh, the idea of putting um, sulfur particles up in the air. And these, these small particles reflect sun back into space. There's actually good geologic evidence that this is effective in cooling the earth. There have been a number of volcanic explosions where uh, volcanoes spew vast amounts of sulfur into the atmosphere. And we actually have been able to measure the reduction in global average temperatures from those injections of sulfur. So we know that that is possible to do. And in fact, someone could put up balloons or perhaps high flying airplanes to um, inject sulfur into the stratosphere. Uh, the disadvantage of the approach is that it is very imprecise. It is like um, bringing a hammer to push um, a needle into um, a, a piece of cloth. It's a very crude technique that can't be controlled. So you can't, for example, say, well, we wanna cool the uh, poles more, but we don't wanna cool this part of the earth too much. Or we um, want to change the temperature, but not change precipitation patterns. Uh, the problem with uh, the sulfur um, solution is that you can't control it to that extent. And in fact, uh, it probably will lead to different patterns of rainfall. And let's suppose um, I just came from California last week. California went through its hottest week in human history. Imagine that some nation had decided to geoengineer and suddenly California has the hottest summer. You can bet that whoever decided to put sulfur particles in the air will be blamed for the heat wave in California. Mm. And how do you um, reimburse then uh, farmers for lost crops and for deaths due to heat stroke, et cetera? Uh, so one thing that the panel concluded is before we start doing something really severe like that, we need a lot of discussion with civil society of what the impacts are and mm. how we indemnify various nations against major losses. Let's suppose there's no rain in India or the monsoon is weaker and uh, uh, India's wheat crop fails. There has to be some way to protect people from those uh, bad outcomes. I mean, Marcia, Marcia, I was going to say that that actually, for me, is, I think, what people would want to ask you about in a nutshell, the risks. I mean, if, if, if this was such a positive way forward or something that should be considered um, by people in terms of trying to mitigate climate change, why haven't they done so already? Um, is it because it's just too risky? Carlo, what do you think? Yeah, um, well, I, I, I completely agree with what Marsha was saying. Um, now, it, it, th that's why when we started looking at this with our colleagues, the first thing we looked at was uh, reversibility. So can we do something that very easily, you know, can be reversed? We can go back easily to the previous uh, situation. Right. And, um, and we actually looked at uh, solar engineering that Marsha was talking about, but we started looking at the other solution. Uh, remember, she was saying the other solution that being proposed is about putting, quote, mirrors out in space. But many people think this is uh, too complex, too difficult, too expensive. Actually, that solution was proposed in the early 2000s by a scientist who at the time was at NASA called Roger Angel, Professor Roger Angel, in an article actually in PNAS, the Proceeding of the National Academy of Sciences, um, <clears throat> proposed really this, to put a thin film in outer space, and made calculations showing that uh, if we were able, uh, by the way, the space in outer space, the best place seems to be what is called a Lagrangian point in between the Earth and the Sun. And then if we're able there to reflect, say, 2% of incoming solar radiation, uh, then we would be able to counter climate change. And also right. reflecting a bit of solar radiation it doesn't seem to be too risky on the planet already. We got very big fluctuations. Different parts of the planet receive, you know, very significant differences in terms of uh, solar radiation. You know, that seems to be compatible with all the different ecosystems there. But our point was then, you know, looking at two questions. The first one is what Marcia said before. Uh, can we actually find 
an effective way to do this. It's not easy to deploy a kind of a mirror the size of Brazil uh, out <laughs> in outer space, you know, between the Earth and the Sun. And the second thing, can we do it in a, in a way that is reversible? And I will mm. not get into the detail now, but by working with, again, colleagues in material science and in other disciplines, what we realize is the best thing maybe actually to fabricate thin film in outer space. And the best way to fabricate thin film actually is uh, what many of us know very well is about making bubbles. When you make a soap bubble, you're, it's, it's based on a physical uh, on a physical process called the Marangoni effect that allows you to do something which is just a few molecules thick. So it's very, very effective. Right. And by doing that, we, we've been studying again about a, a possible way to, to fabricate there and also to make it reversible because we could potentially destroy that thin film and well, then, uh, you know, go back to the previous situation. Well, the fact that these things could be reversible will be reassuring, I'm sure, to lots of people watching. Um, but if, as Carlo says, uh, Marcia, that actually it, it could mitigate um, in quite a significant way, why are we not already doing it? What are, what are the barriers here? So um, the barriers are so difficult to overcome that scientists haven't even been allowed to do small scale experiments. Small scale experiments on um, uh, what, uh, how difficult is it to get these particles up in the stratosphere? Experiments on how long do they last? Our experience from volcanic eruptions is that if you put tons of sulfur into the atmosphere, it will last for about two years and then you'd have to do it again. So that's good because it's reversible. And if you didn't like the outcome, just wait a couple of years and it will go away. Um, but uh, people are very uh, concerned about tinkering with the planet. Mm. We've already tinkered with the planet by emitting um, decades of excess CO2 into the atmosphere. And they're worried that this is going to be worse than the first intervention, which was the release of CO2. Um, there's a whole group of people who actually have such distrust that they believe that there's an industrial military complex that is already tinkering with incoming solar radiation. Every time they see a contrail from a jet plane, they assume someone is spraying something into the atmosphere to change climate and in the most extreme um, uh, conspiracy theories, actually um, change human health and human behavior. Well, I mean, so, that, that yeah. is, well, that is on one hand understandable, I suppose, because you use the word tinkering. Um, people are suspicious. And yet, on the other hand, I can see that it's a huge barrier to development. But you said earlier, Marcia, about having a conversation, a civil conversation with people. Um, you know, when does that need to start, Carlo? When, when, when do we need to hear more about this, where people are not as suspicious of what is being done or might be done in their name? Yeah. Well, well, I think, you know, if you look at research, <clears throat> then, you know, the conversation, I think, should start as soon as possible. And that's not about tinkering or trying anything in, uh, in, in real scale, but it's really about looking at what could be, you know, what are the possible solutions. Again, is try to ensure ourselves to look at what could be a plan B if other things were, uh, were to fail. And going back to your point, I think the key thing is really that conversation, having a conversation and finding then a forum. If you were to decide to do this, clearly we need to have a... A global discussion and the forum to make decisions. Now we know that the UN, you know, is a possible forum that's been working over the past hundred years, but maybe it's not adapted for some of these challenges. Can we think about new global governance? I like before when uh, uh, listening to the little movie on the Club of Rome and people were saying, can we have everybody on the planet, maybe, you know, have a majority vote on the whole of our planet and see, and also, you know, look at, uh, really have a frank and open discussion about that. But at the beginning, will have to be research. And that's why we thought that, uh, you know, we can perhaps contribute with some ideas. Uh, it doesn't need to be what, you know, the idea we, we're looking at. There's many out there. Uh, I wanted to add one point, what we like about solar geoengineering, about spatial solar geoengineering. So we've been outside of the planet. is really that we're not doing anything inside the planet. That was the problem. has been the problem since the Industrial Revolution. Here is about can we actually just be in outer space be reversible and try to see if that can help us. But, but, you know, again, there could be many ideas out there. The important thing, I think, is finding a forum for that conversation to happen and to include everybody on the planet. Yes, Marcia. 
Yeah, I'd like to add another um, problem with uh, putting sulfur in the atmosphere or even putting a mirror out there. There are many people who right now are concerned that that will be used as a panacea to stop mm. uh, efforts to control climate change by yeah. switching <clears throat> to alternative energy sources. Mm. So it's sort of like putting a Band-Aid over a wound, but you never actually heal it. And in fact, it gets worse and worse um, because people are continuing their um, wasteful ways of uh, emitting CO2 into the atmosphere, and we're just covering it up with more and more mirrors and things like that. And what that means then is once you stop it, once the mirrors come out of space, or once the sulfur uh, diffuses um, uh, out of the stratosphere, climate change comes roaring back with a vengeance. And we know that if we actually have to wait for geologic processes to absorb the carbon we've already admitted, we're going to be waiting a thousand years. And ask yourself this question, what possible governance mechanism or what possible implementing organization will be around for a thousand years mm -hmm. to maintain those mirrors or that sulfur in the atmosphere? The only institution I know that's been around for more than a thousand years is the Vatican. And I don't think we want to ask the Vatican to do this. <laughs> Interesting point, though, uh, Marcia. Do you agree, though, um, just briefly uh, to wrap up this session, that is and will be a big concern. It'll be a disincentive. Are there too many people in the world who just say technology is going to rescue us from uh, climate change? Science is going to do the job for us. So let's not worry too much. Let's not invest the money we need to now to decarbonize or change people's attitudes. Isn't that a real risk, Carlo? Yeah, it is a real risk. And that's why I think, you know, we should make clear that this is just a plan B, that nobody's starting to execute anything. It's just re at the moment is not even in plan B. It's actually trying to do research on possible plans B, as the report of the National Academies was suggesting. You know, it's research we, we should do, but we shouldn't, absolutely, we shouldn't use this as an excuse not to do mitigation and adaptation, not to work on, on, on other things. Actually, we've seen a little bit, just a little bit of anecdote after we started launching, we, we just made public some information about the project on our website with all the PIs, all the scientists who have been collaborating in this effort at MIT. And uh, and we've been uh, literally flooded by emails, a lot of them of people who wanted to help, to contribute in different ways and so on. But we also saw what you're saying in some of the emails of so people who say, well, you know, I don't need to to care about in rising sea levels in my home next to the, the ocean will be fine. I can keep on driving my SUV. Uh, I mean, certainly that's what you don't want. That thinking, and that's on the small scale, but you can imagine the same thinking at the scale of a, of a nation, at the, at the scale of big industrial decisions. Uh, that's certainly not the thinking you want to encourage. Carlo and Marcia, thank you very much for a fascinating discussion. Marcia, did you want to say one final thing? Yes, please do. I just wanted to say quickly that the National Academy Committee did look at the double moral hazard here. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. Mm. If you if you don't discuss geoengineering, then you might get to that point where your back's against the wall. If you do discuss it, it might be used as an excuse not to mitigate. And we've decided we've gone far too many decades with people refusing to take action. So it's not considering geoengineering that's going to stop people. It's everything else. Carla? Uh, I just want to say, uh, I think I want to thank Project Syndicate. This was the beginning of the conversation, and I think that's really <laughs> what is needed. Whatever whatever the science, whatever the research, whatever the political decision-making, what we need to have on the planet is a conversation that has to involve everybody. So thank you, Project Syndicate. Oh, well, you're very welcome. Maybe this be the first of many conversations. Thank you both very much for starting us off. Thank now, you. to close today's event, we're lucky to have David Miliband, President and CEO of International Crisis Group. I lead a humanitarian organization that is increasingly challenged by the depth and breadth of humanitarian crises around the world. Just remember the following three figures. 55, that's the number of civil conflicts going on around the world, not including the war in Ukraine. Then think about the number 100 million. That's the number of people on the run from conflict, persecution and disaster around the world. 55 million of them internally displaced in their own countries, 45 million of them refugees who've crossed borders 
into neighboring states. And then think about the number 345. 345 million people who will go to bed hungry tonight at the UN's classification just short of famine. The point about those three statistics is not just that they represent humanitarian crisis, but all of them are exacerbated and in some cases driven by the climate crisis itself. For far too long, the humanitarian movements and the climate-related movements have lived in separate boxes, have argued in separate silos, and have failed to bring together their efforts, their organization, and their ideas. That's what needs to change, and that's what needs to change urgently, given what we're seeing in the world around us. Just think of the Pakistan crisis this summer, and you realize the scale of the danger that exists at the moment. There really is no time to lose. The climate crisis is often described as a market failure. What we see in the humanitarian sector is a system failure. The market failure arises from the failure to internalize the costs of the climate crisis. The system failure arises from the failure of states to fulfill their obligations to their own citizens, the failure of diplomacy to tackle the wars that increasingly exist within the states, and the failure of the international system to uphold the legal rights that civilians and mind aid workers have in conflicts around the world. I think that there are three things that we need to discuss and discuss urgently. The first is how to make climate resilience an important part of the humanitarian sector. The way we do our work needs to reflect the threat of the climate crisis. For my own organization, our work in places like South Sudan, in Syria, in the northeast of the country, in Niger, all represent efforts to make climate resilience a central part of our approach to livelihoods, which we see as core to the humanitarian enterprise. Secondly, we all know that adaptation has been the poor cousin of mitigation when it comes to dealing with the climate crisis. None of us can afford to take our foot off the pedal when it comes to mitigation. We need more, but we also need to elevate the investment and the commitment to adaptation, especially for those communities who've contributed least to the climate crisis, but are least able to survive its ill effects. Thirdly, this can't just be a matter for governments. When governments are in retreat, it takes NGOs and the private sector to come up with solutions. I think that we're at a really vital tipping point. It's a tipping point that relates to politics and practice, but it also has to relate to the work that we do outside government, outside politics, because the needs have never been greater. David Miliband there, who is the president and CEO of the International Rescue Committee. Now, finally, much of the world has been paying tribute to Queen Elizabeth II, who died last week. She was a woman who judged her words very carefully in public, working meticulously to stay above the political fray. She did, however, make this intervention on climate change, a message to the world's leaders as they gathered for COP26 in Glasgow. It is the hope of many that the legacy of this summit, written in history books yet to be printed, will describe you as the leaders who did not pass up the opportunity and that you answered the call of those future generations. That you left this conference as a community of nations with a determination, a desire and a plan to address the impact of climate change. And to recognize that the time for words has now moved to the time for action. Queen Elizabeth II. And those thoughts are sure to echo with world leaders as they prepare to travel to COP27 in Egypt in just a few weeks' time. Well, that's all we have time for today. Thank you so much to all our contributors for making this such a wonderful event. Thanks to everyone behind the scenes at Project Syndicate and High Impact who've worked so hard to make this happen. But most of all, thank you to you, the audience watching. It really would be nothing without you. I'm Jo Coburn, and this has been Forsaken Futures, brought to you by Project Syndicate. Goodbye.